Section 18 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rott Wheeler. Foundations of Mathematics, Part 4. The straight line has been introduced as a whole, as an orderless class. Pieri endows it with order, thus giving it to the character of a series of points, as follows. Given A, B, C, three collinear points, let Y be any other point of the line, and Z the harmonic conjugate of Y with respect to A and C. Let X be the harmonic conjugate of B with respect to Y and Z. By taking a new Y, and hence a new Z, a new X is obtained. The class of X's thus obtainable is named segment A, B, C. It is shown that B belongs to the segment, that its extremities A and C do not, and that the segment A, B, C is the same as the segment C, B, A. The segment has the property, if A, B, C, D be four points of a straight line, and if A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime be four points so situated on another straight line, that the lines A, A prime, B, B prime, C, C prime, D, D prime have a point in common, then D prime belongs to the segment A prime, B prime, C prime, when and only when D belongs to the segment A, B, C. If D does not belong to the segment A, B, C, and is distinct from A and C, then, the four points being collinear, the points A and C are said to separate the points B and D. It is proved that the relation of separation is symmetric, that is, that the points A and C are also separated by B and D, furthermore that the statement is valid if in it we exchange the points of either couple. The ordering of the points of a line is then completed by means of the postulates 15, 16, and 17. Continuity is introduced by number 18. The effect of the postulate 19, namely if A, B, C, D are four non-complanar points, and E a point in none of the planes, A, B, C, A, B, D, A, C, D, B, E, D, then there exists a point common to the line A, E, and the plane B, E, D, is to restrict the geometry to a space of three dimensions. This restriction is essential to the duality of ordinary projective geometry, in virtue of which the notions of point and plane may be interchanged. If we wish to pass to projective geometry of hyperspace, postulate 19 must be omitted and other suitable postulates added. One such, for example, would be if A, B, C, and D be four points not belonging to a same plane, there exists at least one point not in the hyperplane A, B, C, D, whereby hyperplane is meant the class of points on the lines determined by the points of a plane and a point not on the plane. If, now, a definition of projective geometry of three dimensions be required, the answer is, it is the theory consisting of the foregoing 19 postulates, or an equivalent set, together with the propositions logically deducible from them. And, similarly, projective space, of three dimensions, is any class of things, for convenience called points, that are related as prescribed by the foregoing or an equivalent set of postulates. The one undefined notion in projective geometry, as above founded, is that of a straight line. In order that the doctrine shall be quite expressible in terms of logical constants, it is necessary and sufficient that the straight line be defined in such terms explicitly. Such a definition is, a projective straight line, AB, is a relation R between the points A and B, R being symmetric, aliorelative, not subsisting between a point and that point, and transitive, insofar as transitivity is not restricted by aliorelativity. Descriptive geometry. The doctrine of which some account is to be rendered here is not the descriptive geometry commonly so called, created by Gaspard Mage in an elementary form presented to technological students as the semi-practical art of graphically representing space configurations by means of their projections on a plane. This last is about identical with projective geometry, or the geometry of position, as popularly understood. The descriptive geometry to be dealt with here is a new theory having been created by Pasch, Volunzugen über Neuere Geometrie, 1882, and formulated in the Symbols of Modern Logic by Piano, I Principi de Geometria Logicamente Exposti, 1889, and Sui Fundamenti de Geometria in Revista de Mathematica, Volume 4, 1894. How it differs from projective geometry in procedure and fundamentals will appear in the light of the following postulates, as given by Piano, and commentaries upon them. For further analyses of the postulates, the reader may consult the above-cited works of Russell and Coutura. The Piano postulates, undemonstrated propositions, of descriptive geometry are as follows. The meaning of some of them will be clear only by the aid of definitions to follow. 1. There is at least one point. 2. Given a point A, there is a point X distinct from A. 3. Between two coincident or identical points, there is no point. 4. Between two distinct points, there is a point. 5. The segment AB is contained in the segment BA. 6. The point A is not between A and B. 7. If A and B are two distinct points, there are points that belong to A'B. prime 8. If C is a point of the segment AB, and if D is a point of the segment AC, D is also a point of the segment AB. 9. If C and D belong to a segment AB, they coincide, or D is between A and C, or is between C and B. 10. If C and D belong to the ray A prime B, they coincide, or D is between B and C, or C is between B and D. 
11. If B is between A and C, and C between B and D, C is between A and D. 12. If R is a straight line, there exists at least one point outside of R. 13. If A, B, C are non-collinear points, and if D is between B and C, and E between A and D, then there is a point common to AC and the prolongation of BE. 14. If A, B, C are three non-collinear points, and if D is between B and C, and F between A and C, the segments AD and BF have a common point. 15. Given any plane, there exists at least one point outside the plane. 17. If P is a plane, A a point outside the plane, and B a point on the prolongation of one of the segments joining A to points of P, then, if X is any point, it belongs to P, or else P and the segment AX, or else the segment BX, have a common point. 18. Let K be a class of points in the segment AB. There exists a point X of the segment AB, or coinciding with B, such that no point of K is between X and B, and that, Y being any point taken between A and X, there exist points of K between Y and B. Such are the basal assumptions of descriptive geometry. A few explanatory words will make their meaning clear and will serve to show the concept of descriptive space and the corresponding geometry in the process of gradually coming into being. By segment AB is meant the class of points between the points A and B. In this geometry, the notion of segment is central like that of a straight line in projective geometry. By 3, the segment AA or XX is a null segment, one void of points, an empty class. By 4, a segment AB is null if its extremities A and B are identical, coincident. 5 shows that segments AB and BA are one and the same. To be between A and B is the same as to be between B and A. A segment is without direction or sense. By 6, the extremities of a segment are not points of it. By the symbol A prime B, in number 7, called the prolongation of AB beyond B, is meant the class of points X such that B is between A and X. 7 postulates the existence of such prolongation. The existence of A B prime is a consequence, as is also the fact that A prime B equals B A prime, and that A B prime equals B prime A. Such prolongations, which are not segments, are called rays. Number 8 enables us to prove that segment A B contains the segments A C, B C, and C D, that the ray A prime C contains the ray A prime B, that the logical product of the propositions B is between A and C, C is between A and B is false, and that, consequently, the segments A B and the rays A prime B and A B prime have no common point. By help of 9, it is demonstrable that the segment AB is the logical sum of the segments AC and CB and the point C, that, if C is between A and B and D is between C and B, then C is between A and D, that, if C is between A and B, D between A and C, and E between C and B, then C is between D and E, that, under the same hypothesis, the segments AC and CB have no common point, and that, if C and D belong to the segment AB, the segment CD is contained in the segment AB. Such are the properties of segments. Those of rays are found by means of 10 and 11 to be that, under the hypothesis of 10, the ray A prime B is the logical sum of the segment BC, the point C and the ray A prime C. Under the same hypothesis, the segment CD is contained in the ray A prime B. And by 11, if B belongs to the segment AC or to the ray AC prime, the rays A prime C and B prime C coincide. The straight line AB, a term occurring in 12, is defined to be the logical sum of the points A and B, the segment AB and the rays A prime B and B prime A. The first 11 postulates suffice to show that the straight lines AB and BA are identical, that if C is different from A and belongs to the straight line AB, the straight lines AB and AC are identical, and that if C and D are distinct points of the straight line AB, the straight lines AB and CD are one and the same, or what is equivalent that a straight line is determined by any two distinct points of it. Postulates 12 and 13 provide for the concept of plane, as will presently be seen. If H and K be two classes of points, the symbol HK will denote the class of all the points on the segments joining the points of H to those of K. H prime K the class of points on the prolongations of the segments each beyond its K point, once the meaning of H K prime is also clear, and that too of such symbols as A the quantity BC, A prime the quantity BC, etc. From 13 follows that A the quantity BC equals B the quantity AC. This figure or class of points is named a triangle and denoted by triangle ABC. The plane ABC is defined to be a class composed of the non-collinear points A, B, and C, the segments AB, BC, CA, the prolongations of AB prime, BA prime, BC prime, CB prime, CA prime, AC prime, the triangle ABC, and the figures A prime the quantity BC, B prime the quantity CA, C prime the quantity AB, C the quantity A prime B prime, A the quantity B prime C prime, B the quantity C prime A prime. Postulate 14 is essential to prove that a plane is uniquely determined by any three non-collinear points of it. And numbers 15 and 17 are respectively necessary that space shall have three dimensions and that it shall be continuous. Obvious among the notable differences of projective geometry and descriptive geometry are the following. In the former, the straight line is a closed series of points, like the circumference of a circle. In the latter, the straight line is an open series of points. 
Two projective straight lines of a projective plane, or projective line and plane, always have a point in common, but a descriptive plane contains many pairs of non-intersecting straight lines, and a descriptive line and a descriptive plane may or may not have a common point. One point of a descriptive line divides it into two parts, and a pair of points divide it into three parts, one of which is a segment determined by the two points. It requires three points to determine a segment of a projective straight line. Two points separate the line into two portions, and one does not divide it into parts. Two projective planes have a line in common, but two descriptive planes may or may not have a common line, though they have a common line or no common point. It is an interesting and instructive fact that upon the foregoing descriptive postulates it is possible by suitable choice of elements to build up a projective space and geometry. This may be done as follows, and the process further reveals the differences and relationships of the two varieties of space. Let A and B be any two given lines of a descriptive plane pi, and let P be any given point of a descriptive space. The two planes determined by P and A and P and B have a common line L. The class of lines L, thus determined by allowing P to take all positions in descriptive space, is named sheaf of lines. These will have a common point, called the vertex of the sheaf, or not, according as A and B have a common point or not. Again, if S sub 1 and S sub 2 be two sheaves and P a point, not on the common line of the sheaves if they have one, P, S sub 1, and S sub 2 determine a plane pi, namely that containing those lines of S sub 1 and S sub 2 that contain P. The class of planes pi, thus obtainable by varying P, is named pencil of planes. The planes of the pencil will have a common line, called the axis of the pencil, or not, according as S sub 1 and S sub 2 have a common line or not. Finally, let S sub 1, S sub 2, and S sub 3 be any three sheaves whose lines are not all in the planes of the same pencil, and let S sub 4 be a sheaf such that there is a sheaf S whose lines are common to the pencils S sub 1, S sub 3, and S sub 2, S sub 4. The class of sheaves S sub 4 that fulfill the condition will be named hyperpencil of sheaves. If now we denote the new entities, sheaves, pencils, and hyperpencils, respectively by the names points, lines, and planes, it can be shown that these points, lines, and planes constitute a projective space, although as seen, the new elements are defined in terms of descriptive space. Metric geometry. In recent years, various investigators, American and European, have proposed various logically equivalent systems of postulates for this the most ancient form of geometry. Of such systems, that found in Hilbert's Grundlagen der Geometrie, also in English and French, is the most famous. We prefer, however, to present here that of Pieri as being more interesting and not less profound. In this system, there are two undefined terms, namely point and movement. It will be seen that point is merely a name for the element of any system of elements, if such there be, that satisfy the postulates. And movement does not mean ordinary motion, but only a transformation or change of attention from one thing to another. Even so, the process is disregarded. Only the initial and the final stages and not any passage are regarded. The postulates are as follows. Subsequent explanations will make them clear. 1. Point and movement are genuine concepts or classes. 2. There exists at least one point. 3. If P is a point, there exists a point different from P. 4. Every movement is a bi-uniform correlation between two figures. 5. Whatever be the movement mu, which makes the point y, for example, correspond to the point x, there is a movement u that makes x correspond to y. 6. Two movements, mu and gamma, affected successively, the one on the result of the other, are equivalent to a single movement. 7. For each pair of distinct points, there is an effective movement that leaves them fixed. 8. If a, b, and c are three distinct points, and if there exists an effective movement that leaves them fixed, every other movement that leaves a and b fixed leaves c fixed. 9. If A, B, and C are three collinear points, and if D is a point of the line BC other than B, the plane ABZ is contained in the plane ABC. 10. If A and B are distinct points, there exists a movement that leaves A fixed and transforms B into another point of the straight line AB. 11. If A and B are distinct points, and if two movements that leave A fixed transform B into another point of the straight line AB, this point is the same in both movements. 12. If A and B are distinct points, there is a movement that transforms A into B and that leaves one point of the straight line AB fixed. 13. If A, B, and C are three non-collinear points, there is a movement that leaves A and B fixed and transforms C into another point of the plane ABC. 14. If A, B, and C are three non-collinear points, and if D and E are points of the plane ABC common to the spheres C sub A and C sub B, and different from C, then D and E coincide. 15. If A, B, and C are distinct non-collinear points, there exists at least one point outside the plane A, B, C. 16. If A, B, C, and D are four non-complanar points, there exists a movement that leaves A and B fixed and transforms D into a point of the plane A, B, C. 17. If A, B, C, and D are four distinct collinear points, the point D cannot be only upon one of the segments A, B, A, C, B, C. 18. If A, B, and C are three collinear points, and if C is between A and B, no point can be at once between A and C and between B and C. 19. 
If A, B, and C are three non-collinear points, every straight line of the plane ABC that has a point in the segment AB has a point in the segment AC or in the segment BC, or it contains one of the points A, B, C. 20. If K is a class of points in the segment AB, there exists in the segment, or coincides with B, a point X, such that no point of K is between X and B, and that for every point Y between A and X, there is a point K between Y and X, or coincident with X. Two figures, classes of points, coincide when and only when they are composed of the same points. 4 means that a movement is a one-to-one -one relation between two figures. The movements mu and u, v, are each the other's converse. They are mutually converse by uniform relations. By 6, the relative product of the movements mu and blank is a movement. The relative product of mu u leaves every point fixed, or, as we say, transforms all points each into itself. In contradistinction from such movements, others are described as effective. 7 provides for rotation of a figure about two of its points. The straight line AB is defined to be the class of all points that remain fixed in case of every movement leaving A and B fixed. It is a matter of proof that a straight line is determined by any two distinct points of it. 8 is not valid in space or four or more dimensions, and hence no special postulate restricting our geometry to three dimensions is necessary. It is readily proved that any movement whatever transforms any and every triplet of collinear points into such a triplet. In other words, a movement is a collineation. By plane ABC is meant the figure composed of the points of the lines joining A to points of BC, or B to points of AC, or C to points of AB, it being assumed that A, B, and C are non-collinear points. It is a theorem that every movement converts a plane into a plane. Postulate 9 is necessary to prove that a plane is determined by any three non-collinear points of it. By the sphere B sub A is meant the class of points such that for each of them there is a movement transforming it into B while leaving A fixed. The point A is the center of the sphere. It is demonstrable that every movement transforms spheres into spheres, that any movement that leaves the center of a sphere fixed transforms the sphere into itself, and that, if two spheres have but one common point, that point is collinear with the centers of the spheres. 10, 11, and 12 provide for transforming a line into itself, and 13 and 14 make the like provision for the plane. A circle is the logical product of a sphere and a plane containing its center. The center of the circle is that of the sphere. The notion of perpendicularity is introduced by the definition the pair AC of points is said to be perpendicular to the pair AB when and only when there is a movement that leaves A and B fixed and transforms C into another point of the straight line AC. The notion is readily extensible to straight lines. 15 provides for a plurality of planes, and 16 for the transformation of one plane upon another. The notion of equidistance is introduced by the definition, a point A is equidistant from two points B and C when and only when it is in the center of a sphere containing B and C. It is demonstrable that, in a plane containing the distinct points A and B, the class of points equidistant from A and B is the straight line perpendicular to the straight line AB and containing the midpoint of the segment AB, that a straight line perpendicular to two straight lines AB and AC is perpendicular to every straight line that contains A and is contained in the plane ABC, and other theorems respecting perpendicularity are readily proved. A point is interior to a sphere if it is the midpoint of two distinct points of the sphere. If not, it is exterior or else a point of the sphere. A point of a plane containing a circle is interior or exterior to the circle according as it is interior or exterior to the sphere having the same center as the circle and containing the circle. A sphere having for center the midpoint of two points A and B and containing them is called the polar sphere of the points A and B. The notion between is introduced by the definition, a point X is between points A and B if it is contained in the straight line AB and is interior to the polar sphere of A and B. The class of points between two points A and B is named segment AB. The segment AB is less than the segment CD when and only when there exists a movement that transforms A into C and B into a point between C and D. Two segments, or other figures, are congruent if there exists a movement transforming one of them into the other. It is demonstrable that if two segments are not congruent, one of them is less than the other. The notion angle is defined, and to it are extended the ideas of less than and congruence. If A, B, and C are non-collinear points, the triangle ABC is the figure composed of the points of the segments, each joining A and a point of the segment BC. The three theorems regarding congruence are proved, and so on and so on. By 20, which provides for continuity, is deduced the Archimedean axiom as a theorem. Thence follows the idea of measurability of segments. General remarks. No geometry involves ideas not found in logic or definable in terms of logical constants, and no geometry contains other undemonstrated propositions than in the primitive propositions of logic. The name point is merely that of a class of things, if there be such things, that satisfy a certain set of postulates, but geometry does not assert the actual existence of any such classes, and does not assert the truth of the postulates. What it does assert is that, if such a class exists, then such and such a body of theorems are valid regarding the class. Geometry is thus a body of implications. It says merely, if so and so, then so and so. This important fact is somewhat disguised by the categorical form in which postulates are often stated. Bibliography
Instead of giving a list of the works constituting the vast and rapidly growing modern literature dealing with the foundations of mathematics in general, with the foundations of special branches and with modern logic, it will be sufficient to refer the reader to Russell's Principles of Mathematics, Volume 1, Cambridge University Press, and to Couturat's Les Principes des Mathématiques, Paris, Félix Alcan, and Traité de Logistique, Alcan, wherein nearly all the important works are cited in connections showing the bearings of them. Most of the works are too technical for the general reader, who will naturally begin with the mentioned treatises of Russell and Coutura, extending his reading gradually according to increasing ability and interest. Cassius J. Kaiser, a drain professor of mathematics, Columbia University. End of section 18. Section 19 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria James, The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Part 3, Mathematical Applications. Chapter 1, Early Non-Mechanical Applications. Modern life, as a whole, lies under a debt to mathematics far beyond calculation. Science has shown many underlying principles which govern matter, life, and mind in their several environments, and in their relation each to each, but it has required the mathematical faculty and the mathematical knowledge to transpose those principles into productive value. Mathematics may be termed the spirit practical application the flesh of a single and indivisible entity. Hence the term applied mathematics is to be used with caution, since it is inherent in the nature of mathematics that it shall not be divorced from any of its subsidiary uses, but remain as a vigorously vital and governing law. Mechanical principles, for example, are mainly mathematical deductions from principles enunciated by pure science, even as that same pure science finds itself dependent upon mathematical expression for the enunciation of those principles. The very words that are spoken or written bear a definite relation each with the other, and no more mathematical concept than relation could well be thought of. From the abstruse and remote questions of the affirmation of a stellar parallax in astronomy, to the multiplication of yeast cells in making a loaf of bread, from the lofty flights into the regions of the mathematically infinite to the counting of change over a counter, mathematics is applied and practical. It does not always appear mechanical because it has not always been transliterated into such forms, and these non-mechanical applications existed in antiquity as they do now. Applied mathematics, in that sense, is as old as applied thought, and applied thought is coeval with man. To think aright, says Professor Cassius Kaiser in an illuminative recent lecture on mathematics, is no characteristic striving of a class of men. It is a common aspiration, and mechanics, mathematical physics, mathematical astronomy, and the other chief, Anvendungsgebete, spheres of application of mathematics as geodesy, geophysics, and engineering in its various branches, are all of them but so many witnesses to the truth of Ryman's saying that natural science is the attempt to comprehend nature by means of exact concepts. A gas molecule regarded as a minute sphere or other geometric form, however complicated, Stars and planets, conceived as ellipsoids or as points, and their orbits as loci, time and space, mass and motion, and impenetrability, velocity, acceleration, and energy, the concepts of norm and average, what are these but mathematical notions? And the wondrous garment woven of them in the loom of logic, what is that but mathematics? Indeed, every branch of so-called applied mathematics is a mixed doctrine, being thoroughly analyzable into two disparate parts. One of these consists of determinate concepts formally combined in accordance with the canons of logic, i.e., it is mathematics and not natural science viewed as a matter of observation and experiment. The other is such matter 
and is natural science in that conception of it, and not mathematics. No fiber of either component is a filament of the other. It is a fundamental error to regard the term mathematicization of thought as the importation of a tool onto a foreign workshop. It does not signify the transition of mathematics conceived as a thing accomplished over into some outlying domain like physics, for example. Its significance is different radically, far deeper and far wider. It means the growth of mathematics itself, its extension and development from within. It signifies the continuous revelation, the endlessly progressive coming into view of the static universe of logic, or, to put it dynamically, it means the evolution of intellect, the upward striving and aspiration of thought everywhere, to the level of cogency, precision, and exactitude. It is the aggregate of things thinkable logically that constitutes the mathematician's universe, and it is inconceivably richer in mathetic content than can be any outer world of sense, such as the physical universe according to which we chance to have our physical being. Close quote. The term practical, in its common acceptation, often denotes shorter periods of obtaining results than are indicated by science. It implies a substitution of natural sagacity and mother wit for the results of hard study and laborious effort. It implies the use of knowledge before it is acquired, the substitution of the results of mere experiment for the deductions of science, and the placing of empiricism above philosophy. But if to be practical, be given its true and right signification, then it becomes a word of real import and definite value. In its right sense, it denotes the best means of making the true ideal the actual, that is, of applying the principles of science in all the practical business of life and of bodying forth, in material form, the conception of taste and genius. Beyond the obvious application of simple and known principles, the whole problem of the practical lies in the measurement, modification, and best uses of the forces of nature. The uses and applications of these must be fashioned according to certain forms indicated by scientific formulae. These formulae are constructed from the laws which regulate the cohesion of the particles of the substance employed. The nature of the force to be applied, the amount of that force, and the ultimate end to be attained. All these fixed laws of force, all their combinations, and all the forms of the material employed in using them for practical purposes, can only be reached through the processes and language of mathematics. The language of geometry and number furnished the architect with all the signs and instruments of thought necessary to a perfect ideal of his work before he took the first step in its execution. It also enabled him, by drawings and figures, so to direct the hand of labor as to form the actual after its pattern, the ideal. The various parts may be constructed by different mechanics at different places, but the law of science is so certain that every part will have its right dimensions, and when all are put together, they form a perfect whole. The influence of mathematical investigations on physical theories is not restricted to any single stage, but makes itself apparent throughout the whole course of their evolution. Numbers form the connecting link between theory and verification, and they always imply mathematical formulae, however simple these may be. There seems to be historical evidence that a practical acquaintance with certain rules of number and form was acquired by ancient peoples, especially by the Egyptians, before there was any knowledge of mathematics as a pure science. In Babylonia, geometrical figures were used in augury, Herodotus, Plato, and Strabo ascribe the origin of geometry to the changes which annually took place from the inundation of the Nile, and to the consequent necessity of settling disputes as to the extent of property, and of determining the tax due to the government. There was a well-developed system of mensuration in the time of the traditional biblical Joseph, and besides the extraordinary mechanical ability of the Egyptians in handling stone, 
they were able to construct accurately leveled canals to ascertain the various elevations of the country and, tradition says, to deflect the course of the Nile. At the time of King Menes, who is supposed to have performed this extraordinary feat, dikes had been built and sluices invented with all the mechanism pertaining to them. The water supply into plains of various levels was regulated, and a report was made of the exact quantity of land irrigated, the depth of the water, and the time it remained upon the surface. All this required much mathematical skill, and it was not likely to be carelessly carried on, since the amount of taxes and the price of provisions for the ensuing year were ascertained at the time of the inundation. Nilometers, instruments for measuring the gradual rise or fall of the river, were in use in various parts of Egypt as early as the 12th dynasty. Quote, the employment of squared granite block and the beauty of the masonry of the interior of the pyramids, says George Rawlinson, which has not been surpassed, if even equaled, at any subsequent age, also proved the degree of skill the Egyptians had reached at a time long anterior to the rudest attempts at masonry in Italy or Greece. We may well conclude that the principles of construction were known to them, as well as the engineering skill required for changing the course of the Nile, even before the reign of Menes. The immense weight of the blocks of stone used in building shows that the Egyptians were well acquainted with mechanical powers and a method of applying force with wonderful success. The largest obelisk in Egypt is calculated to weigh about 297 tons, is more than 70 feet in height, and was carried 138 miles from the quarry. The Egyptians could not only move immense weights, they could erect obelisks, lift large stones to a considerable height, and adjust them with the utmost precision, and this sometimes in spaces that would not admit the introduction of the inclined plane. Pliny mentions that one obelisk, built by Ramesses, was 99 feet in height. He adds, quote, and, fearing lest the engineer should not take sufficient care to proportion the power of the machinery to the weight he had to raise, he ordered his son to be bound to the apex, more effectually to guarantee the safety of the monument. Quote. Of the science of arithmetic, the Egyptians early were in need, both in their domestic economy and in the application of geometrical theorems, but its greatest utility was in the cultivation of astronomical studies. Indeed, mathematics was the handmaid of astronomy among the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Egyptians. An ancient writer says, quote, The orders and motions of the stars are observed at least as industriously by the Egyptians as by any people whatever, and they keep a record of the motions of each for an incredible number of years, the study of this science having been, from remotest times, an object of national ambition with them, close quote. There is record in Egypt of the solid contents of barns before the calculation of areas. In the papyrus of Achmes, reaching back to about 2500 BC, there are problems relating to the pyramids which disclose some knowledge not only of geometrical figures, but the principles of proportion and possibly trigonometry. Cantor is of the opinion that the Egyptians were familiar with the properties of the right triangle in case of sides with the ratio 345 as early as 2000 BC. This opinion is based on the orientation of the temples and early records of the rope stretching method of laying out the land. The Arabs developed the notion of specific gravity and gave experimental methods for its determination. Al-Biruni used for this purpose a vessel with a spout slanting downward. It was filled with water up to the spout, then the solid was immersed, and the weight of the overflow determined. This, together with the weight of the solid in air, yielded the specific gravity. Al-Khazani, in his book of the Balance of Wisdom, written 1137 BC, describes a curious beam balance with five pans for weighing in air and in water. One pan was movable along the graduated beam. He points out that air, too, must exert a buoyant force, causing bodies to weigh less. Figure 1. Use of Lever in Building Pyramids 
Thales, in his Pyramid and Ship Measurements, was probably the first to apply theoretical geometry to practical uses. He was able to predict an eclipse of the sun in 585 BC, and several practical applications of geometry are attributed to him. But the illustrious name among the Greeks, in respect to both mathematical and mechanical science, is that of Archimedes. The most important services of Archimedes were rendered in the science of pure mathematics, but his popular fame rests chiefly on his application of mathematical theory to mechanics. Hieron of Alexandria, called Hieron the Elder, was a mathematician and also a practical surveyor who lived in the 2nd century BC. His teacher, Chesabias, was celebrated for his mechanical inventions such as the water clock, the hydraulic organ, and catapult. Hieron himself was the inventor of the Iolipile, which contains the germ of the steam engine and a curious mechanism known as Hieron's fountain. It is, however, in architecture that the Greeks and Romans made the most marked advance upon the achievements of the Egyptians, mechanically as well as artistically. The three principles of the beam, the arch, and the truss were known to the Greeks and Romans. Indeed, it is the opinion of H. W. Desmond that they possessed all the technical knowledge of the medieval builders. It is evident that they adopted from the Egyptians whatever they needed. The construction of the arch dates from an early period. Mathematical skill is a great factor in the development of architecture. The very term implies tools and force at command, and instruments for supplementing the labor of the hands. The draftsman, in designing a structure, should be conversant not only with the nature of his material, but also with the forces to which it is to be subjected, their magnitude, direction, points of application, and their effects. The ancient Romans not only constructed arches, but the largest domes of brick now in existence. These structures rest on all sides of the space to be covered, but there is also the simple or wagonhead vault, which rests on only two sides of the covered rectangle, leaving the other two free from all pressure. Further than this, the Romans invented that highly ingenious contrivance, the cross vault, which exerts its whole pressure solely on the angles of the apartment, leaving all the sides free. The origin of this construction is simply the crossing of two vaulted passages lying at right angles to each other, and each corridor required to be left perfectly free. The crossway is covered by a ceiling that rests solely on the four angles or corners, the elliptic lines that form the internal ridges, called groins, can support not only themselves but the whole of the upper ceiling. The beauty and advantages of this kind of vaulting led the Romans to use it not only over crossways, but over corridors and long apartments with a boldness of construction that has never been equaled. With the decline of Roman power, this art of vaulting was lost, and for centuries the basilicas of Italy and the churches of all Roman Christendom remained with nothing but timber roofs. The Byzantine Greeks, however, retained or else reinvented another mode of vaulting possessing many of the advantages of groining, but not all of them. This system depended on two simple geometrical principles. First, that every section of a sphere by a plane is circular, and second, that every intersection of two spheres is a plane curve and therefore circular. The Greek vaulting then consists wholly of spherical surfaces. A hemispherical dome may be supposed whose base circumscribes the plane of any apartment or compartment, square, rectangular, triangular, or polygonal. Imagine the sides of this plane continued upward as vertical planes till they meet the hemispheric surface. This meeting line must in every case be a semicircle and may therefore be made an open arch and the portions of the dome thus cut off from every side of its base may be omitted altogether, provided their office as buttresses to the remaining portion above be replaced by the pressure of some other vault, which may be of any kind, if it be applied against the semicircular arch. Hence no walls are required on the sides of the supposed compartment, all the weight of the pendative dome, as it is called, being thrown on the angles of its plane. Thus this dome serves for covering an open crossway, and is so applied at the Mosque of St. Sophia at Constantinople.
the covered crossway, a 115-foot square, might well be esteemed, in the barbarous age of its erection, a wonder of the world. The same idea repeated without end, the same sprouting of domes out of domes, continues to characterize the Byzantine style, both in Greek churches and Turkish mosques, down to the present day. Hope describes them as a congeries of globes of various sizes growing one out of another. This system of vaulting has been adopted by two great modern architects, Sir Christopher Wren at St. Paul's in London, and by Soufflot at St. Genevieve, Paris by the former with great success, and in both made to harmonize well with the Roman style. There is no more striking and beautiful example of the application of mathematical principles to practical affairs than in the history of architecture. The close reasoning of the mathematician has been behind and above the work of the draftsman and artesian. His imagination has reached out boldly to the projection of new designs, restrained always by the immutable laws of science. His achievement is to unite strength and durability with beauty and geometric truth with grandeur. In architecture, says Ferguson, there is still to be taken into consideration not only that subtler and complexer force, the personal genius of the architect, but also the native genius of the people in which he is a sharer, that spirituality or temper of mind which is obvious enough in its stronger manifestations. Close quote. Thus, the nations that showed a talent for mathematics were building nations, since here was a science which could be definitely and immediately applied to practical use. It is necessary to discharge from the mind many unconsciously implied conditions before an exact picture of the pre mechanical age can be gained. All the raw material of mechanical science was at hand, as much before as after the magical words of Newton or of Helmholtz, but mathematical genius had not yet touched the spring which dissipated the inertia of established habit. But before the civilized world could be transformed from a world utilizing, as one might say, only the more obvious natural forces, to a world filled with devices for multiplying hands and feet, for increasing the value of eye and ear, a news-gathering world where oceans are neighborly high roads and warfare a contest of scientific equipment. Before this transformation could happen, the mathematician had need to direct his analytic and speculative powers to the natural phenomena of the universe. Concerning this stage of the development of mathematics, Cassius J. Kaiser writes, a traditional conception, still current everywhere except in critical circles, has held mathematics to be the science of quantity or magnitude, where magnitude, including multitude, with its correlate of number, as a special kind, signified whatever was capable of increase and decrease and measurement. Measurability was the essential thing. That definition of the science was a very natural one for magnitude did appear to be a singularly fundamental notion, not only inviting but demanding consideration at every stage and turn of life. The necessity of finding out how many and how much was the mother of counting and measurement, and mathematics, first from necessity and then from pure curiosity and joy, so occupied itself with these things that they came to seem its whole employment. Indeed, for direct beholding, for immediate discerning of the things of mathematics, there is none other light but one, namely psychic illumination, but mediately and indirectly they are often revealed, or at all events hinted, by their sensuous counterparts, by indications within the radiance of day, and it is a great mistake to suppose that the mathematic spirit elects as its agents those who, having eyes, yet see not the things that disclose themselves in solar light. To facilitate eyeless observation of his sense-transcending world, the mathematician invokes the aid of physical diagrams and physical symbols in endless variety and combination. The logos is thus drawn into a kind of diagrammatic and symbolical incarnation, gets itself externalized, made flesh, so to speak, and it is by attentive physical observation of this embodiment, by scrutinizing the physical frame and makeup of his diagrams, equations, and formulae, by experimental substitutions in and transformations of them, 
by noting what emerges as essential and what is accidental, the things that vanish and those that do not, the things that vary and the things that abide unchanged as the transformations proceed and trains of algebraic evolution unfold themselves to view. It is thus, by the laboratory method, by trial and by watching that often the mathematician gains his best insight into the constitution of the invisible world thus depicted by visible symbols. Indeed, the time is at hand when at least the academic mind should discharge its traditional fallacies regarding the nature of mathematics, and thus in a measure promote the emancipation of criticism from inherited delusions respecting the kind of activity in which the life of the science consists. Mathematics is no more the art of reckoning and computation than architecture is the art of making bricks or hewing wood, no more than painting is the art of mixing colors on a palette, no more than the science of geology is the art of breaking rocks, or the science of anatomy the art of butchering. Pernicious, because deeply embedded and persistent, is the fallacy that the mathematician's mind is but a syllogistic mill, and that his life resolves itself into a weary repetition of A is B, B is C, therefore A is C, and Q E D. That fallacy is the Carthago de Lenda of regnant methodology. Reasoning, indeed, in the sense of compounding propositions into formal arguments, is of great importance at every stage and turn, as in the deduction of consequences, in the testing of hypotheses, in the detection of error, in purging out the dross from crude material, in chastening the deliverances of intuition, and especially in the final stages of a growing doctrine in welding together and concatenating the various parts into a compact and coherent whole. But, indispensable in all such ways as syllogistic undoubtedly is, it is of minor importance and minor difficulty compared with the supreme matters of invention and construction. When the great Sophus Lee, great comparative anatomist of geometric theories, creator of the doctrines of contact transformations and infinite continuous groups, and revolutionizer of the theory of differential equations, was asked to name the characteristic endowment of the mathematician. His answer was in the following quaternion. Fantasy, energy, selbstvertrauen, selbstkritik. Not a word you observe about ratiocination. Fantasy, not merely the fine, frenzied fancy that gives to airy nothings a local habitation and a name, but the creative imagination that conceives ordered realms and lawful worlds in which our own universe is as but a point of light in a shining sky. Energy, not merely endurance and doggedness, not persistence merely, but mental vis viva, the kinetic, plunging, penetrating power of intellect. Selbstvertrauen and Selbstkritik, self-confidence aware of its ground, deepened by achievement and reinforced until in men like Richard Dedekin, Bernhard Bolzano, and especially Georg Cantor, it attains to a spiritual boldness that dares leap from the island shore of the finite over into the all-surrounding boundless ocean of infinitude itself, and thence brings back the gladdening news that the shoreless vast of transfinite being differs in its logical structure from that of our island home only in owning the reign of more generic law. Close quote. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Mathematical Applications, Chapter 2, Chronology and Orology, Part 1. Although the ancients gave so much of their attention to understanding and recording the facts of astronomy, yet there was very little systematic attention given to the computation of time or to the chronological aspect of history. Chronology is comparatively a modern science, yet a highly important one. Accurate chronology is essential to all reasoning from historical facts. 
the mutual dependence and relations of events cannot be traced without it. With great propriety it has been called one of the eyes of history, while geography with equal propriety has been said to be the other. Present acquaintance with the truths of astronomy would have been as deep had Eastern philosophers never turned their eyes to the realms of space or watched the harmonious movements of the worlds in the firmament above. The moment, says Sir John Herschel, astronomy became a branch of mechanics, a science essentially experimental, that is to say, one in which any principle laid down can be subjected to immediate and decisive trial, and where the experience does not require to be waited for. Its progress acquired a tenfold acceleration, nay, to such a degree that were the results of all the observations from the earliest ages annihilated, leaving only those made in Greenwich Observatory during the single lifetime of masculine. The whole of this most perfect of sciences might, from those data and as to the objects included in them, be at once reconstructed, and appear precisely as it stood at their conclusion. The operation, indeed, of Arabian knowledge of astronomy in the early ages was perhaps principally to lend a plausibility to astrology. The observers of the stars, like Columbus predicting the eclipse, had the power of astonishing when they prepared to delude. The most obvious measures and divisions of time are those suggested to all men by the revolutions of the heavenly bodies. These are three, days, months, and years, the day from the revolution of the earth on her axis or the apparent revolution of the sun around the earth, the month from the periodical changes in the moon, the year from the annual motion of the earth in her orbit round the sun. These three divisions are not commensurate, and this has caused the chief embarrassment in the science of chronology. It has, in point of fact, been difficult so to adjust them with each other in a system of measurement as to have the computed time and the actual time perfectly in agreement or coincidence. The day was undoubtedly the earliest division, and originally was distinguished, it is likely, from the night and extended from sunrise to sunset. It was afterwards considered as including also the night, and was marked as the time from sunrise to sunrise. But the beginning of the day has been reckoned differently by different nations for civil purposes. At sunrise by the Babylonians, Persians, and Syrians, and inhabitants of India. At sunset by the Jews, Athenians, ancient Gauls, and Chinese. At midnight by the Egyptians, Romans, and moderns generally. Astronomers in their calculations consider the day as beginning at noon, after the manner of the Arabians. There have also been various modes of subdividing the day. The division of time into hours is very ancient, the oldest hour being the twelfth part of a day. Herodotus observes that the Greeks learned from the Egyptians, among other things, the method of dividing the day into twelve parts, and the astronomers of Cathaya still retained that method at the time of Herodotus. The division of the day into twenty-four hours was not known to the Romans before the Punic War. The Greeks in the time of Homer seem not to have used the division into hours, his poems present the more obvious parts of the day, morning, noon, and evening. But before the time of Herodotus, they were accustomed to the division of the day and of the night also into twelve parts. They were acquainted also with the division of the day and night into four parts each, according to the Jewish and Roman custom. The Romans subdivided the day and night each into four parts, which were called vigils, or watches. They also considered the day and night as each divided into twelve hours. Three hours, of course, were included in a vigil. The day vigils were designated simply by the numerals, first, second, third, fourth. But as the second vigil commenced with the third hour, the third vigil with the sixth hour, and the fourth with the ninth hour, the terms first, third, sixth, and ninth are also used to signify the four vigils of the day. The night vigils were designated by the names Vesper, Evening, Midnight, and Cockcrow. The first hour of the day began with sunrise, and the twelfth ended at sunset. The first hour of the night began at sunset, and the twelfth ended at sunrise. Of course, therefore, the hours of the day in summer were longer than those of night, and in the winter they were shorter. The division of time into months, without much doubt, had its origin in the various phases or changes of the moon. It included the time of the moon's revolution round the earth, or between two new moons, or two successive conjunctions of the sun and moon. The mean period is twenty-nine days, twelve hours, forty-four minutes. It was considered to be twenty-nine and a half days, and the ancients commonly reckoned the month as consisting alternately of twenty-nine and thirty days. The Greeks thus reckoned their months. Twelve lunations so computed formed the year but it fell short of the true solar year by about eleven and a quarter days, 
making in four years about 45 days. To reconcile this and bring the computation by months and years to coincide more exactly, another month was intercalated every two years. In the first two years, a month of 22 days, and in the next two, a month of 23 days. Thus, after a period of four years, the lunar and solar years would begin together. But the effect of this system was to change the place of the months relatively to the seasons, and another system was adopted. This was based on the supposition that the solar year was 365 and a quarter days, while the lunar was 354, which would in a period of eight years give a difference of 90 days. The adjustment was made by intercalating in the course of the period three months of 30 days each. Its invention was attributed to Cleostratus of Tenedos. It was universally adopted and was followed in civil matters even after the more perfect cycle of Meton was known. With the Romans, the case was somewhat different. Under Romulus, they are said to have had only ten months, but Numa introduced the division into twelve, according to that of the Greeks. But, as has been seen, this formed only a lunar year, a little more than eleven days short of the solar year. Therefore, an extraordinary month was to be inserted every other year. The intercalating of this and the whole charge of dividing the year was entrusted to the pontifices, and they managed, by inserting more or fewer days, to make the current year longer or shorter, as they for any reason might choose. This finally caused the months to be transposed from their stated seasons, so that the winter months were carried back into autumn and the autumnal into summer. Julius Caesar put an end to this disorder by abolishing the intercalation of months and by adopting a system which was available by the more accurate division of the year. A consideration of the division of the year takes the historian back to the twilight of history. It is well known that the Babylonians had a system of notation called the sexagesimal, which reveals a high degree of mathematical insight. It was used chiefly in the construction of a system of weights and measures, and reveals some knowledge of geometrical progressions, but the indications are that it was in the possession of few, and was used but little. The base of this system was the number 60, the Babylonians reckoned the year at 360 days. The Grecian year, however, which was established by Solon and continued to the time of Meton and even after, consisted of 365 and a quarter days. This division was probably not formed until considerable advance had been made in astronomical science, and it was long after its first adoption before it attained to anything like an accurate form. The Roman year seems to have consisted of 365 days until the time of Julius Caesar, who attempted to remedy the confusion resulting from the method employed by the Romans to adjust their computations by lunar months to the solar year. Caesar instituted a year of 365 days and six hours. To remove the error of 80 days, which computed time had gained of actual time, he ordered one year of 445 days, which was called the year of confusion. To secure a proper allowance for the six hours which had been disregarded, but which would amount in four years to a day, he directed that one additional day should be intercalated in the reckoning of every fourth year. Thus, each fourth year should have 366 days, the others 365. This is called the Julian year, and begins to show some of the familiar landmarks of modern chronology. But even in the plan of the great Julius there was still a fault, owing to an error in computed time. The extra day was intercalated too soon, that is, computed time, instead of gaining six hours a year as was supposed, gained only five hours, forty-eight minutes, and fifty-seven seconds, so that a whole day was not gained in four years. The intercalated day was inserted too soon by forty-four minutes and twelve seconds, and of course computed time by this plan lost forty-four minutes and twelve seconds every four years, or eleven minutes and three seconds every year. In 131 years, this makes a loss of computed time of one day, or computed time would be one day behind actual time. In 1582 AD, this loss had amounted to ten days, and Pope Gregory XIII attempted to remedy the evil by a new expedient. This was to drop the intercalary day every hundredth year except the four hundredth. The Gregorian year was immediately adopted in Spain, Portugal, and Italy, and during the same year in France, in Catholic Germany in 1583, in Protestant Germany and Denmark in 1700, in Sweden in 1753. In England, it was adopted in 1752 by Act of Parliament, directing the 3rd of September to be styled as the 14th, as computed time had lost 11 days. This was called the change from old to new style. 
The Julian calendar, or old style, is still retained in Russia and Greece, whose dates consequently are now twelve days in arrear of other countries of the Western Hemisphere. It is also retained in the Greek and Armenian churches. Different nations have begun the year at different seasons or months. The Romans at one time considered it as the beginning of March, but afterward in January. The Greeks placed its commencement at the summer solstice. The Christian clergy used to begin it at the 25th of March, and this style was practiced in England and in the American colonies until 1752 AD, on the change from old style to new, when the 1st of January was adopted. In adjusting the different methods of computing time or the division of time into days, months, and years, great advantage is derived from the invention of cycles. These are periods of time so denominated from the Greek word meaning a circle, because in their compass a certain revolution is completed. Under the term cycle may be included the Greek Olympiad, a period of four years, the Octeris, a period of eight years, the Roman Lustrum, a period of five years, and also the Julian year, or period of four years. The period of four hundred years, comprehended in the system of Gregory, may justly be termed the cycle of Gregory. Besides these, there are the lunar cycle, the solar cycle, the cycle of indiction, and the Julian period. The lunar cycle is a period of nineteen years. Its object is to accommodate the computation of time by the moon to the computation of the sun, or to adjust the solar and lunar years. The nearest division of the year by months is into twelve, but twelve lunations fall short of the solar year by about eleven days. Of course, every change in the moon and any year will occur eleven days earlier than it did in the preceding year, but at the expiration of nineteen years they occur again nearly at the same time. This cycle was invented by Meaton, an Athenian astronomer who lived about 430 BC. The improvement was at the time received with universal approbation, but not being perfectly accurate, it was afterwards corrected by Eudoxus and subsequently by Callippus. The cycle of Meton was employed by the Greeks to settle the time of their festivals, and the use of it was discontinued when these festivals ceased to be celebrated. The Council of Nice, however, wishing to establish some method for adjusting the new and full moons to the course of the sun, with a view to determining the time for Easter, adopted again the Meton cycle, and from its great utility they caused the numbers of it to be written on the calendar in golden letters, which has obtained for it the name of the golden number. This name is still applied to the current year of the lunar cycle, and is always given in the almanacs. The solar cycle is a period of twenty-eight years. Its use is to adjust the days of the week to the days of the month and the year. As the year consists of fifty-two weeks and one day, it is plain that it must begin and end on the same day, and if fifty-two weeks and one day were the exact year, or if there were no leap year, the year would, after seven years, begin again on the same day. But the leap year, consisting of fifty-two weeks and two days, interrupts the regular succession of every fourth year, and the return to the same day of the week is not effected until four times seven, or twenty-eight years. This cycle is employed particularly to furnish a rule for finding Sunday, or to ascertain the dominical letter. Chronologers employ the first seven letters of the alphabet to designate the seven days of the week, and the dominical letter for any year is the letter which represents Sunday for that year. Tables are given for the purpose of finding it in chronological and astronomical books. The cycle of indiction is a period of fifteen years. The origin and primary use of this has been the subject of various conjectures and discussions. It seems to have been established by Constantine the Great in the 4th century as a period at the end of which a certain tribute should be paid by the different provinces of the empire. Public acts of the emperors were afterward dated by the years of this cycle. The Paschal cycle is a period of 532 years, after which Easter falls on the same day of the year. End of section 20《》section 21 of the science history of the universe volume 8 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by andrew gantz the science history of the universe volume 8 edited by francis rolt wheeler mathematical applications chapter 2 chronology and horology part 2 the cycle which has been perhaps most celebrated is that termed the Julian period, and was invented by Joseph Scaliger. 
Its object was to furnish a common language for chronologers by forming a series of years, some term of which should be fixed, and to which the various modes of reckoning might be easily applied. To accomplish this, he combined three cycles of the moon, sun, and indiction, multiplying 19, 28, and 15 into one another, which produces 7,980, after which all three cycles will return in the same order, every year taking again the same number of each cycle as before. This invention would be of great importance if there was no universally acknowledged epoch, or fixed year, from which to compute, but its use is almost entirely superseded by the general adoption of the Christian era as a fixed standard. It is essential to correct and exact chronology that there should be some fixed epoch to which all events may be referred and be measured by their distance from it. It is of comparatively little consequence what the epoch is, provided it is fixed and acknowledged, as it is perfectly easy to compute in a retrograde manner the time before it, as well as in a direct manner the time after it. The Greeks for a long time had no fixed epoch, but afterwards they reckoned by Olympiads, periods of four years. These began 776 BC. The Romans often reckoned by lustrums, often by the year of the consul or emperor. The building of the city was their grand epoch, which began 753 BC. The present era began to be used about 360 AD, according to some writers, but others state that it was invented by Dionysus, a monk, about 527 AD. The Mohammedan era, or Hijira, was founded on the flight of Muhammad from Mecca to Medina, 622 AD. One of the interesting vagaries of chronological history is found in the era of the French Republic, which the revolutionists attempted to establish. This was introduced in 1793, with a formal rejection of the Sabbath and of the hebdominal week, and a novel arrangement and pedantic nomenclature of the months. The 22nd of September was fixed as the beginning of the year, the year consisted of twelve months of thirty days each, which were divided not by weeks, but into three decades or periods of ten days. As this would comprise but 360 days, five were added at the close of the last month of the year, called complementary days, and at the close of every fourth year a sixth day was added, called the Day of the Republic. The cycle of the four years was termed the Franciade. This calendar was used about twelve years. The Gregorian calendar was restored on January 1st, 1806. The mechanical instruments that have been made for the measurement of time present in themselves an interesting pictorial commentary upon the more abstract science of chronology. Horology, the art of measuring the hours or any definite small portions of time, began when man first marked the shadow of any upright object and noted its movements in relation to the apparent movement of the sun. The next step came when he noted that a staff placed in the ground and pointed toward the north will always, at a particular hour of the day, throw a shadow in the same direction. This fact, undoubtedly observed by the Babylonians in the most ancient times, suggested the idea of the sundial. This instrument consists of two parts, the gnomon, or upright staff, or style, usually a piece of metal, always placed parallel to the Earth's axis, and therefore pointing to the north star and the dial, another plate of metal or stone, usually horizontal, on which are marked the directions of the shadow for the several hours, their halves and quarters, and sometimes smaller divisions. Sundials were generally known in ancient times. It is suggested that the circular rows of stones built by the Druids were used to mark the sun's path and to indicate the times and seasons. Obelisks are also supposed by some writers to have been used for measuring sun shadows. The Greeks were perfectly acquainted with the method of making sundials with inclined styles. Small, portable sundials were much prized before the introduction of watches, and were provided with compasses by which they could be turned round so that the style pointed to the north. Sundials have been found in the ruins of ancient cities of Greece, in Rome, in the excavations of Pompeii and Herculaneum, and many medieval specimens are well known. The objections to a sundial are that the shadow of the style is not sufficiently well-defined to give very accurate results, and that refraction, which always makes the sun appear a little too high, throws the shadow a trifle towards noon at all times. That is, the time is a little too fast in the morning, and a little too slow in the afternoon. More than that, a correction is always necessary in order to find civil or clock time. The simplest form of sundial is the best and as a regulator of clocks, the dial is good within one or two minutes. 
The noon mark is simply a north and south line marked on a horizontal plane, and the style is any object fixed to the dial and slanted so as to point to the North Pole. On four days of the year the sun is right with the mean time, and the shadow mark may be set on those days, or on other days the noon mark may be set by consulting the table in the almanac, which shows the variation of the sun from civil time in even minutes. Thus, on October 10th, 1909, the noon mark could be made by the shadow of the style at 11.47 by the clock, and it would be right for all time to come. A device less dependent on the climactic conditions was the water clock, or clepsydra. It is said that this instrument was in use among the Chaldeans and ancient Hindus. Sextus Imperius says that the Chaldees used such a vessel for finding their astrological data, but remarks that the unequal flowing of the water and the alterations of the atmospheric temperature rendered their calculations inaccurate. In this instrument, the water which falls drop by drop from the orifice of one vessel into another floats a light body that marks the height of the water as it rises against a graduated scale, and thus denotes the time that has elapsed. As a measure of hours of the day in countries such as Egypt, where the hours were always equal and thus where the longer days contained more hours, the water clock was very suitable. But in Greece and Rome, where the day, whatever its length, was always divided into twelve hours, the simple water clock was as unsuitable as a modern clock would be, for it always divided the hours equally, and took no account of the fact that by such a system the hours in summer were longer than in winter. In order, therefore, to make the water clock available in Greece and Italy, it became necessary to make the hours unequal, and to arrange them to correspond with unequal hours in the Greek day. This plan was accomplished by placing a float upon the water in the vessel that measured the hours, and on the float stood a figure made of thin copper, with a wand in its hand. This wand pointed to an unequally divided scale. A separate scale was provided for every day in the year, and these scales were mounted on a drum which revolved so as to turn round once in the year. Thus, as the figure rose each day by means of a cogwheel, it moved the drum round one division, or one three hundred and sixty-fifth part of a revolution. By this means, the scale corresponding to any particular day or winter or summer was brought opposite the wand of the figure, and thus the scale of hours was kept true. In fact, the water clock, which kept true time, was made by artificial means to keep untrue time, in order to correspond with the unequal hours of the Greek days. One of the more complicated forms of the water clock was probably invented by Stesibus of Alexandra. In the Athenian courts, a speaker was allowed a certain number of amphorae of water for his speech, the quantity dependent on the importance of his suit. Both the simple and more elaborate forms of clepsydrae were introduced into Rome in the 2nd century BC. A Chinese water clock, reputed to be over 3,000 years old, consisted of four copper jars on ascending steps with small openings and filled every morning. The purpose of the series was to obviate the irregularity in dropping, which would be caused by the greater weight in the first jar at the beginning of the day. The running of fine sand from one vessel into another was found to afford a still more certain measure of time, so the hourglass came into being. This instrument consists of two bulbs of glass united by a narrow neck. One of the bulbs is nearly filled with dry sand, fine enough to run freely through the orifice in the neck, and the quantity of sand is just as much as can run through the orifice in an hour, if the instrument is to be really an hourglass, in a minute if a minute glass. It is said that King Alfred observed the lapse of time by noting the gradual shortening of a lighted candle. The pendulum is the mechanical basis of modern clocks, and was first scientifically investigated by Galileo in the latter half of the 16th century. The story runs that while he was praying one day in the cathedral at Pisa, his attention was arrested by the motion of the great lamp which, after being lighted, had been left swinging. Galileo proceeded to time its oscillations by the only watch in his possession, namely his own pulse. He found the times as near as he could tell to remain the same, even after the motion had greatly diminished. Thus was discovered the isochronism of the pendulum. Later experiments carried out by Galileo showed that the time of oscillation was independent of the mass and material of the pendulum, and varied as the square root of its length. Galileo's invention did not become generally known at that time, and fifteen years later, in 1656, Christian Huygens independently invented a pendulum clock, which met with general and rapid appreciation. 
The honor of this invention belongs, therefore, to both Galileo and Huygens. Wheelwork had been known long before the time of Galileo, and had been skillfully applied by Archimedes. When, therefore, some sort of wheel mechanism was needed to keep the pendulum oscillating, the mechanical means were at hand. Galileo saw that if the pendulum could be kept swinging, a timepiece could be constructed which would be mathematically perfect. There must be some reservoir of force such that when a pendulum comes back and touches it, the touch shall allow some pent-up power to escape and to drive the pendulum forward. An arrangement of this kind was contrived by Galileo. He provided a wheel with a number of pins around it. The pendulum had an arm attached to it, and there was a ratchet with a projecting arm which engaged with the pins. This arrangement is called an escapement. The type of escapement invented by Galileo was, for practical purposes, full of imperfections, and it was left for later inventors to modify his ideas and to improve on them until an accurate timepiece was achieved. The balance wheel was invented, which does the work of the pendulum, and various escapements such as the crown or verge escapement, the anchor and crutch escapement, the dead beat escapement, and the gravity escapement, have all taken their place in the development of the timepiece. The prime requisite of a good escapement is that the impulse communicated to the pendulum be invariable, notwithstanding any irregularity or foulness in the train of wheels. The compensating balance wheel is a balance wheel whose rim is formed of two metals of different expansive powers, so arranged that the change of size of the wheel as the temperature rises or falls is compensated for by the change in position of the parts of the rim. The anchor escapement was employed in that popular and excellent timepiece used throughout the 18th and in the early part of the 19th century, and now known as the grandfather clock. In this clock, the pendulum is hung from a strip of thin steel spring, which allows it to oscillate and supports it without friction. This manner of supporting pendulums is now very much in use. The watch differs from the original clock in that it has a vibrating wheel instead of a vibrating pendulum. As in a clock, gravity is always pulling the pendulum down to the bottom of its arc, but does not fix it there, because the momentum acquired during its fall from one side carries it up to an equal height on the other. So in a watch, a spring, generally spiral, surrounding the axis of the balance wheel, is always pulling this towards a middle position of rest, but does not fix it there, because the momentum acquired during its approach to the middle position from either side carries it just as far past on the other side and the spring has to begin its work again. The balance wheel at each vibration allows one tooth of the adjoining wheel to pass, as the pendulum does in a clock, and the record of the beats is preserved by the wheel which follows. A main spring is used to keep up the motion of the watch instead of the weight used in a clock, and as a spring acts equally well whatever be its position, the watch keeps time although carried in the pocket or in a moving ship. In winding up a watch, one turn of the axle on which the watch is fixed is rendered equivalent by the train of wheels to about 400 turns or beats of the balance wheel, and thus the exertion during a few seconds of the hand which winds up gives motion for 24 or 30 hours. The laws of the mechanism of the clock can easily be understood. The experiments with the pendulum and with springs revealed certain principles which were early reduced to six and can be stated thus. 1. A harmonic motion is one in which the accelerating force increases with the distance of the body from some fixed point. 2. Bodies moving harmonically make their swings about this point in equal times. 3. A spring of any sort or shape always has a restitutional force proportional to the displacement. 4. And therefore, masses attached to springs vibrate in equal times, however large the vibration may be. 5. The bob of a pendulum oscillating backward and forward acts like a weight under the influence of a spring and is therefore isochronous. 6. The time of vibration of a pendulum is uninfluenced by changes in the weight of the bob, but is influenced by changes in the length of the pendulum rod. The time of vibration of a mass attached to a spring is influenced by changes in the mass. Early attempts were made to use a pendulum clock at sea, suspending it so as to avoid disturbance to its motion by the rocking of the ship. These proved vain. It therefore became desirable that a watch with a balance wheel should be contrived to go with a degree of accuracy in some respects comparable with the accuracy of a pendulum clock. To encourage inventors, an act of Parliament was passed in the thirteenth year of Queen Anne's reign, 
promising a large reward to anyone who would invent a method of finding the longitude at sea true to half a degree, that is, true to thirty geographical miles. If the finding of the longitude were to be accomplished by the invention of an accurate watch, then this involved the use of a watch that should not, in several months going, have an error of more than two minutes, or the time the earth takes to turn through half a degree of longitude. This was the problem which John Harrison, a carpenter of Yorkshire, made it his life business to solve. His efforts lasted over forty years, but at the end he succeeded in winning the prize. His instruments have been much improved by subsequent inventors, and have resulted in the construction of the modern ship's chronometer, a large watch about six inches in diameter, mounted on axles in a mahogany box. The marine chronometer differs from the ordinary watch in the principle of its escapement, which is so constructed that the balance is free from the wheels during the greater part of its vibration, and also in being fitted with a compensation adjustment similar to that in the balance wheels of the finer clocks and watches. The balance spring of the chronometer is heliacoidal, that of the watch spiral. One of the inventions of modern times is the pneumatic clock, which is one of a series of clocks governed by pulsations of air sent at regular intervals to them through tubes at a central clock or regulator. The movement of the central clock compresses the air in the tube and causes a bellows to expand on each dial, thus moving the hands. Another recent invention is a clock without wheels or pendulum. It consists solely of two inclined plates with zigzag tracks and the clock framework supporting them. A perforated disc connected with the shaft which journals in the frame, and two ball weights suspended in each tower and connected by means of a cord to the shaft successfully furnish the motive power. These weights are raised daily. So the ingenuity of man goes on measuring this earthly element of time. Laplace said that time is to us the impression left on the memory by a series of events, and that motion and motion only can be used in measuring it. Thus it is motion, whether of the shadow on the grass, the dropping of water, or the continuous oscillations of a swinging body, which is the necessary and unvarying element in all the measurements of time. End of section 21、section、22 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria James. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Part 3 Mathematical Applications. Chapter 3 Surveying and Navigation. One of the earliest necessities of civilization was a system of ascertaining by measurement. The shape and size of any portion of the Earth's surface and representing the results on a reduced scale on maps. This is the surveyor's art and is supposed to have originated in Egypt, where property boundaries were annually obliterated by the inundations of the Nile. In Rome, surveying was considered one of the liberal arts, and the measurement of lands was entrusted to public officers who enjoyed certain privileges. Julius Caesar conceived the idea of a complete survey of the whole empire. For this purpose, three geometers were employed Theodotus, entrusted with the survey of the northern provinces, Xenodoxus, with the survey of the eastern, and Polycletus, of the southern. It is stated that a partial survey was finished in 19 BC and the whole completed in 6 AD. The materials collected were lodged in the public archives, receiving from time to time marks and notes to designate the various changes in the provinces. It was consulted by Pliny. The numerous changes at length required the construction of another chart with corrected measurements, which was effected about 230 AD under Alexander Severus. Of this chart, the celebrated document Tabula Putingeriana. Is supposed by some modern critics to be an imperfect copy. The mathematicians of the Alexandrian school made a distinct contribution to the art of surveying. Most authorities believe Heron of Alexandria to be the author of Dioptra, though some writers have attributed it to another mathematician of a later date by the name of Heron. Dioptra, 
says Venturi, were instruments resembling the modern theodolites. The instrument consisted of a rod four yards long with little plates at the end for aiming. This rested upon a circular disc. The rod could be moved horizontally and also vertically by turning the rod around until stopped by two suitably located pins on the circular disc, the surveyor could work off a line perpendicular to a given direction. The level and plumb line were also used. Heron explains, with the aid of these instruments and of geometry, a large number of surveying problems, such as to find the distance between two points, only one of which is accessible, or between two points which are visible but both inaccessible, from a given point to run perpendicular to a line which cannot be approached, to find the difference of level between two points, and to measure the area of a field without entering it. The Dioptra discloses considerable mathematical ability, but it gives rules and directions without proof. The higher development of the art of surveying, like so many other mechanical arts depending on mathematics, is of comparatively recent date. The enormous areas of new land opened for habitation in the New World, the constructions of railroads, bridges, and waterworks, have employed the keenest practical minds in solving large surveying and engineering problems, of which the government does a large part. Surveys may be divided into three classes. First, those made for general purposes or information surveys which may be exploratory, geodetic, geographic, topographic, or geologic. Second, those made for jurisdictional purposes, or cadastral surveys, which define political boundaries and those of private property and determine the enclosed areas. Third, there are surveys made for construction purposes or engineering surveys, on which are based estimates of the cost of public and private works such as canals, railways, water supplies, and the like, and their construction and improvement. The topographic survey, one of those in the first class, is made for military, industrial, and scientific purposes. The topographic map, made directly from nature by measurements and sketches on the ground, is the mother map from which all others are derived. It shows with accuracy all the drainage, relief, and cultural features which it is practicable to represent on the scale chosen. These features are numerous and important if the government maps of the advanced modern nations are to be taken as a model. On the topographical maps issued by the United States Geological Survey are exhibited hydrography, or water features, such as ponds, streams, lakes, and swamps. Hypsography, or relief of surface, as hills, valleys, and plains. And the features constructed by man, as cities, roads, and villages, with the names and boundaries. The uses of topographic maps are many. For the purposes of a national government or a state, they are invaluable as they furnish data from which may be determined the value of projects for highway improvement, for railways, for city water supply and sewerage, and for the subdivision into counties, townships, and the like. They serve the military department in locating encampment grounds, in planning practice or actual operations in the field and during war, in indicating the precise situations of ravines, ditches, buildings, hills, and streams. The post office department utilizes them in considering all problems connected with the changing of mail routes, star routes, and especially in connection with contracts and assignments of rural free delivery routes. In the future, wooded areas are to be indicated on the United States government maps so that foresters will find them useful, as well as those people who are investigating mineral resources, water power, and land reclamation. The operations involved in surveying are the measurement of distances, level, horizontal, vertical, and inclined, and of angles, horizontal, vertical, and inclined, and the necessary drawing and computing to represent properly on paper 
the information obtained by the field work. If the tract to be surveyed is so large that the curvature of the Earth's surface must be taken into account, it is a geodetic survey. The practical basis of surveying is the mathematical theory of the triangle and the solution of the various problems of the triangle by means of geometrical formulae and logarithms. If two angles and one side of a triangle are known, the third angle and the length of the other two sides can be computed by easy geometrical rules. Figure 10, examples of triangulation. The use of logarithms, which are artificial numbers so devised that they shorten the processes of multiplication and division, reduces the work of computing the long tables of angles and measurements, which often falls to the work of the surveyor. Now, an actual measurement of a portion of the Earth's surface can be made by anyone by means of a rope, a tape, or a chain, thus ensuring actual knowledge of the length of one side, called the baseline, of the future triangle. By means of a telescope and a level, together with other ingenious devices placed at the end of the baseline, two objects in a given area are sighted, as, for instance, a church steeple in one direction, and a signal placed at the other end of the baseline. The three points are the apexes of the triangle formed by connecting lines. The angles can be measured by the instruments at the surveyor's hand. The length of the baseline is known, therefore, the length of the other two sides can be computed. This principle of triangulation has many variations, and in actual practice, there are many complicating elements. The topography of an area of any size hangs not on one, but on a system of triangles. In the preliminary work, an arbitrary line, or meridian, is established from which to compute the measurements. But if the actual position is required, that is, the location on the Earth's surface according to latitude and longitude, observations of the sun or of the fixed stars must be made, and the measurements recorded. The elevation of the pole measures the distance of the observer from the equator, and this distance is the latitude of a place, north or south, the pole lying midway between the highest and lowest positions of the pole star. In practice, other means, not quite so accurate, but useful, may be used for determining the latitude. One of the common methods, exact enough for ordinary geographical reconnaissances, is to measure the angular altitude of the sun when on the meridian, and from this altitude, with the aid of the declination taken from the nautical almanac, and with correction for refraction, the latitude is obtained. This method on land requires the use of an artificial horizon in place of the natural. But to fix the position of any place on the globe, it is necessary to know at what point on the circle of latitude it lies, or its longitude. This is a more difficult matter, and one that requires for its determination, astronomically, the introduction of the element of time. Strictly speaking, longitude is the angle at the pole contained between two meridians, one of which, called the prime meridian, passes through some conventional point from which the angle is measured. The longitude of the conventional point is zero, and longitudes are reckoned east and west from it to 180 degrees in arc, and to 12 hours in time, 15 degrees being equal to one hour. In Great Britain, universally, and in the United States generally, geographers reckon from the meridian of the transit circle at the Royal Observatory of Greenwich in England, the meridian of Washington is also used occasionally in the United States. On shore, the most accurate method is to compare the time of the two places by means of the electric telegraph, while at sea, the local time being determined by observation of some celestial object, it is compared with Greenwich time, as shown by a chronometer carefully set and regulated before sailing. The instruments used in surveying are numerous, but the more important are the measuring chain, the vernier, the level, the barometer and compass, the transit, 
the sextant, and the adolite. The instruments commonly used in the measurement of angles are the compass, which determines directions and, indirectly, angles, and the transit, which determines angles and, indirectly, directions. The sextant is an angle-measuring instrument, the use of which is confined to certain particular operations, such as the location of soundings taken offshore and angular measurements at sea. The compass consists of a line of sight attached to a graduated circular box, in the center of which is hung, on a pivot, a magnetic needle. At any place on the Earth's surface, the needle, if allowed to swing freely, will assume a position in what is called the magnetic meridian of the place. If the direction of any line is required, the compass may be placed at one end of the line, and the line of sight may be made to coincide with the line. The needle lying in the magnetic meridian and the zero of the graduations of the circular needle box being in the line of sight, the angle that the line on the ground makes with the magnetic meridian is read on the graduated circle. At a very few places on the Earth's surface, the needle points to the true north. When it does not point thus, the angle that the magnetic meridional plane makes at any point with the true meridional plane is called the magnetic declination. This declination is subject at every place to changes, regular and irregular, so that the magnetic bearings of lines run with the compass are required to be reduced to the true bearings. The sextant is an important instrument in surveying and navigation used for measuring the angular distance of two stars or other objects, or the altitude of a star above the horizon the two images being brought into coincidence by reflection from the transmitting horizon glass. In the hands of a competent observer, the work of the sextant is extremely accurate. The first inventor of the sextant, Quadrant, was Newton. A description of this instrument was found among his papers after his death, not, however, until after its reinvention by Thomas Godfrey of Philadelphia in 1730. This is the instrument used by seamen for observations for finding latitude and longitude. The transit is used for measuring horizontal angles and resembles a theodolite, but is not intended for very precise measurements. The theodolite has appeared in a variety of forms. Its purpose is to measure horizontal and sometimes vertical angles. It consists essentially of a telescope which has a motion about a horizontal axis which rests in two pillars which are perpendicular to the axis of rotation of the telescope. These pillars are fixed at right angles to a plate which turns upon a vertical axis and to which is attached a vernier. Around this is a second plate, graduated and concentric with the first. It may also be provided with a vertical circle and if this is not very much smaller than the horizontal circle, the instrument is called an altazimuth. If it is provided with a delicate striding level and is in every way convenient for astronomical work, it is called a universal instrument. A small altazimuth with a concentric magnetic compass is called a surveyor's transit. A theodolite in which the whole instrument, except the feet and their connections, turns relatively to the latter, and can be clamped in different positions, is called a repeating circle. Figure 11, Essential Parts of Theodolite A. Telescope B. Eye tube C. Ratchet and pinion for moving eye tooth D. Screw for adjustment of cross wires E. Axis of rotation F. Pillars supporting axis G. Compass H. Upper plate carrying vernier I. Lower graduated plate J. Clamp and tangent screws for upper plate K. Levels M. Ball and socket joint with four leveling screws N. Spindle axis of rotation of azimuth plate T. Tripod A hydrographic survey is one that has to do with any body of water and may be undertaken for any one of a number of purposes. One of the most important uses of hydrographic surveying is to supply maps of the bed of the sea, or harbor, or bay, or river, for the information of seamen. 
In this case, it is necessary to locate the channel's dangerous rocks and shoals. In many cases, the work of the hydrographic surveyor goes much farther than this and determines the cross-sections of streams, their velocities, their discharge, the direction of their currents, and the character of their beds. The topography of the bed of a body of water is determined by sounding, that is, measuring the depth of water. If many points are observed, a contour map of the bottom may be drawn, the water surface being the plane of reference. For depths less than 15 or 20 feet, a pole is used. Soundings made in moderately deep water are made with a weight, known as a lead, attached to a suitable line. There is a deep sea sounding machine, by the aid of which soundings may be made to great depths with a close approach to accuracy. This result has been attained by a combination of improvements in which great ingenuity has been displayed and in which the inventive genius of Sir William Thompson has been particularly conspicuous. The principal features of the most perfect sounding machines are 1. The sinker, which is a cannonball through which passes a cylinder provided with a valve to collect and retain a specimen of the bottom, the cylinder being, by an ingenious mechanical arrangement, detached from the shot, which remains at the bottom. 2. The line, made of steel wire, weighing about 14 and one half pounds to the nautical mile. 3. Machinery for regulating the lowering of the sinker and for reeling in the wire with the cylinder attached in such a manner that the irregular strain due to the motion of the ship may be guarded against and the danger of breakage thus reduced to a minimum. In the deepest accurate sounding yet made, the bottom was reached at the depth of 4,655 fathoms. Figure 12. The Solar Transit the determination of the coastline is accomplished by a general scheme of triangulation, just as the topographical map of land areas is determined by it, but the necessity of taking observations from a ship makes the practice somewhat different. A map of a section of coast is the double product of the measurements of angles and baselines and the soundings taken to determine the depth of the water. The survey is made by two parties, one on shore and one in a boat sailing along the coast. If the reckoning of a ship could be accurately kept as she runs along a coast, a very good chart could be made simply by taking exact bearings of various points on the shoreline and noting the time. The track of the ship would be the baseline, and the intersections of the bearings would fix the positions of the shoreline. The latitude and longitude would be determined accurately at intervals of 40 or 60 miles, and the intervening points could be plotted by plain surveying methods. The bearing of any terrestrial object can be determined from a ship by astronomical methods, but owing to currents, leeway, and difficulties in steering, the accuracy of the track base cannot be depended upon. Therefore, the astronomical observations are made on shore with the transit and zenith telescope. The ship and shore parties proceed along the coast by carefully determined stages, each party taking angular measurements from three points and soundings. Both parties take angular measurements from some fixed object farther inshore, and by comparing observations determining the exact position of the ship at certain intervals, and establishing a system of triangles not only with the shore party but with new fixed objects at each stage, the data for coastline are obtained. The work can be plotted on a polyconic chart to include the coast, the scale depending on its extent. The art of the land surveyor is closely allied to that of the seaman, who is obliged to find his course in any extended voyage by angular observations of the heavenly bodies and the mathematical solution of the problems thus offered. The mariner has more than an academic interest in determining his position, it is a matter of life and death to him, and navigation depends mainly upon the acquisition of that knowledge. Navigation is the art or science of directing the course of vessels as they sail from one part of the world to another. The management of the sails, or as it may be of machinery, the holding of the assigned course by proper steering, and the working of the ship generally pertain rather to seamanship. 
The two fundamental problems of navigation are the determination of the ship's position at a given moment and the decision of the most advantageous course to be steered in order to reach a given point. The methods of solving the first are, in general, four. One, by reference to one or more known and visible landmarks. Two, by ascertaining through soundings the depth and character of the bottom. Three, by calculating the direction and distance sailed from a previously determined position. And four, by ascertaining the latitude and longitude by observations of the heavenly bodies. The places of the sun, moon, planets, and fixed stars are deduced from observation and calculation, and are published in nautical almanacs, the use of which, together with logarithmic and other tables computed for the purpose, is necessary in reducing observations taken to determine latitude, longitude, and the error of the compass. The calculation of a ship's place at sea, independently of observations of the heavenly bodies, is called dead reckoning. The ship's position is calculated simply from the distance she has run by the log and the courses steered by the compass, this being rectified by due allowances for drift and leeway. In very early times, dead reckoning was an important branch of knowledge, in which the instruments for measuring time, such as the sand glass, played a considerable part. The sand glass is still found on many sailing ships using the old-fashioned log. The earliest mode of measuring the speed of a vessel at sea was by throwing overboard a heavy piece of wood so shaped that it resisted being dragged through the water and with a line tied to it. The block of wood was the log and the string had knots in it, so arranged that when one knot ran through a sailor's fingers in half a minute, measured by the sand glass, the vessel was going at the speed of one nautical mile an hour, ten knots on the line, ten miles, and so forth. The nautical mile is of such a length that sixty of them constitute one degree on a great circle of the earth. Therefore, the knots are fifty feet and seven inches apart. Patent logs are generally used now at sea, those most commonly found on vessels being either the harpoon or the taffrail log. The harpoon log is shaped like a torpedo and has at one end a metal loop to which the log line is fastened, and at the other, fans which cause the machine to spin round as it is drawn through the water. The spinning of the instrument sets a clockwork machinery in motion, which records the speed of the vessel upon dials, the rotation of the instrument being, of course, dependent upon the rate at which it is dragged through the water. In the taffrail log, the recording machinery is secured to the taffrail, and the fan is towed astern at the end of a long line. If the sea were a smooth, plain surface, without currents or tides, it would be a simple matter to fix accurately the position of a vessel, and to take her from one place to another on the earth's surface by dead reckoning only. But as it is in constant motion, influenced by irregular currents, and tides and the drift of the waves, it becomes necessary to have some more accurate method to ensure safe navigation, and this is to be found in the system of observation of the heavenly bodies, or, in other words, in the science of nautical astronomy. Thus the angular measurement of the sun and the fixed stars by means of the sextant becomes a necessity, and also the solution of the triangle problems by means of logarithms, and trigonometrical formulae. Since the sailor always has the horizon and zenith with him, he can find his latitude at any time by taking the meridian altitude of the sun and correcting that by the declination found in his nautical almanac. His longitude will be found by the aid of the sun and a chronometer. The apparent time at sea he will find by observing the sun's hour angle Apparent time must be turned into mean time by applying the equation of time, and mean time at ship must be compared with mean time at Greenwich, as ascertained by the chronometer. The difference between these two is the ship's longitude. Nautical almanacs are published by the governments of Great Britain, the United States, and most other maritime powers. 
These are almanacs for the use of navigators and astronomers, in which are given the ephemerides of all the bodies of the solar system, places of the fixed stars, predictions of astronomical phenomena, and the angular distances of the moon from the sun, planets, and fixed stars. The laws of the tides and of storms must also be studied by the seamen, especially the law of storms in a navigational sense. This expression generally means the law of circular storms or cyclones, and should be understood by all who are responsible for the safe conduct of foreign-going ships. Owing to the nature of the cyclone, very fair general rules can be made which assist the mariner in steering a course away from the storm's center. A good many generalizations have been made in regard to winds in a wide sense. Airy found that the wind never blows steadily for any period of time except from eight points of the compass, when in any other quarter it is merely shifting round to one of these points. It never blows at all directly from the south. The two most prevalent winds are south-southwest and west-southwest. The first serious study of the circulation of winds on the Earth's surface was instituted at the beginning of the second quarter of this century by W. H. Dove, William C. Redfield, and James P. Epsey, followed by researches of W. Reed, Pittington, and Elias Loomis. But the deepest insight into the wonderful correlations that exist among the varied motions of the atmosphere was obtained by William Farrell, 1817 to 1891. He was born in Fulton County, Pennsylvania, and brought up on a farm. In 1885 appeared his recent advances in meteorology. In the opinion of a leading European meteorologist, Julius Hahn of Vienna, Farrell has contributed more to the advance of the physics of the atmosphere than any other living physicist or meteorologist. Farrell teaches that the air flows in great spirals toward the poles, both in the upper strata of the atmosphere and on the Earth's surface beyond the 30th degree of latitude, while the return current blows at nearly right angles to the above spirals in the middle strata as well as on the Earth's surface, in a zone comprised between the parallels 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. The idea of three superposed currents blowing spirals was first advanced by James Thompson, but was published in a very meager abstract. Another theory of the general circulation of the atmosphere was propounded by Werner Siemens of Berlin, in which an attempt is made to apply thermodynamics to aerial currents. Important new points of view have been introduced recently by Heimholtz, who concludes that when two air currents blow one above the other in different directions, a system of air waves must arise in the same way as waves are formed on the sea. He and A. Oberbeck showed that when the waves on the sea attain lengths of from 16 to 33 feet, the air waves must attain lengths of from 10 to 20 miles and proportional depths. Superposed strata would thus mix more thoroughly and their energy would be partly dissipated. From hydrodynamical equations of rotation, Heimholtz established the reason why the observed velocity from equatorial regions is much less in a latitude of, say, 20 degrees or 30 degrees than it would be were the movements unchecked. Another science bearing directly on navigation is the construction of vessels, both in its architectural aspect and in its relations to magnetism. The earth being a magnet, it induces magnetism in all things on its surface. When an iron ship is being built, the hammering which she undergoes causes magnetism of a more or less permanent character to be induced in her. This is known as sub-permanent magnetism, because though a ship rarely loses it altogether, it alters very much after the vessel is launched, through change of position, through being knocked about in a heavy sea, and from other causes. In the case of a ship built head south in northern latitudes, her blue polarity will be in her bow, and the north point of her compass needle will be attracted to it. 
This will cause westerly deviations as the ship's head passes through the western half of the compass and easterly when through the eastern. If her head is north when building, her stern will have blue polarity and she will have easterly deviation with her head in the western semicircle of the compass and westerly deviation with her head in the eastern semicircle. With her head east when building, she will have more blue polarity in her starboard side than in her port, and with her head west when building, there will be easterly deviation on southerly courses and westerly deviation on northerly. Figure 14, Chart of Magnetic Variation A ship, like everything else, has its center of gravity, though the center is not a fixed point. It varies with every change in the position and quantity of the weights in her. A ship has also her center of buoyancy. This is the geometrical center of her immersed portion, and its position can be arrived at with great certainty. Thus, a vessel floating upright and at rest will fulfill certain conditions. First, she will displace a weight of water equal to her own weight. Secondly, her center of gravity will lie in one and the same vertical line with the center of gravity of the volume of water displaced, and in that line is the center of buoyancy. If weights are moved in a vessel laterally, the position of her center of gravity is changed laterally too, but when she is healed by wind or sea, no change occurs in it. The buoyancy, acting upward through the center of buoyancy, shifting as it does from side to side as a ship is healed over or rolls through the action of wind or sea, is the upward riding force mainly to be relied upon to keep a vessel from capsizing. The knowledge of mathematical laws and principles is necessary to good seamanship, but perhaps in no art is the practical and actual handling of apparatus more useful than in that of the mariner. Theory can but lead the learner to the edges of the subject. Science and practice must go hand in hand before any substantial acquirements can be gained. End of section 22section 23 of the science history of the universe volume 8 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by maria james the science history of the universe volume 8 edited by francis rolt wheeler part 3 mathematical applications chapter 4 mechanical principles it is the privilege of the modern to make the most of an environment of mechanism, a development consequent upon the growing complexity of society. This, while it adds greatly to the luxury of the whole, reduces the sphere of the individual, making it no longer possible to be well versed in many lines. The day of the jack at all trades is past, and the day of the expert has come. Numbers form the connecting link between theory and the application of theory to practical arts. In every mechanical principle, mathematical formulae are implied, though they may be extremely simple. It is for the mathematician to find out how far experimental confirmation of a theory can be pushed and where a new hypothesis is necessary. Facts apparently unconnected are found to have their origin in a common source, and often only the mathematician can trace their connection. More than this, the mathematician is able to draw corollaries and secondary truths from a given principle which the experimentalist alone does not discover. Mechanical science, said William J. M. Ranking, enables its possessor to plan a structure or machine for a given purpose without the necessity of copying some existent example to compute the theoretical limit of the strength and stability of a structure or the efficiency of a machine of a particular kind, to ascertain how far an actual structure or a machine fails to attain that limit, and to discover the cause and remedy of such shortcoming, to determine to what extent in laying down principles for practical use it is advantageous for the sake of simplicity to deviate from the exactness required by pure science and to judge how far an existing practical rule is founded on reason, how far on custom, and how far on error. 
A signal illustration of the truth of these words is offered in the famous instance of falling bodies. Aristotle proved to his own satisfaction, it seemed, and told the world at large that heavy bodies fall to earth faster than lighter ones, and it was left for Galileo, more than a thousand years later, to disprove a statement whose truth or falsity, it would seem, might have been established by anyone. It required mathematical science to confute experimental error. Figure 15, arm as a lever. Weight is raised by shortening of muscle, M muscle, W weight, X point of application, Y fulcrum. Not only has mechanical nomenclature been largely taken from animals, but many of the principal mechanical devices have pre-existed in them. Examples of levers of all three orders are to be found in the bodies of animals. The human foot contains instances of the first and second, and the forearm of the third order of lever. The kneecap is practically a part of a pulley. There are several hinges and some ball and socket joints with perfect lubricating arrangements. Lungs are bellows, and the vocal organs comprise every requisite of a perfect musical instrument. The heart is a combination of four force pumps acting harmoniously together. The wrist, ankle, and spinal vertebra form universal joints. The eyes may be regarded as double lens cameras with power to adjust local length and able by their stereoscopic action to gauge size, solidity, and distance. The nerves form a complete telegraph system with separate up and down lines and a central exchange. The circulation of the blood is a double line system of canals in which the canal liquid and canal boats move together, making the complete circuit twice a minute, distributing supplies wherever needed and taking up return loads wherever ready without stopping. It is also a heat distributing apparatus, carrying heat from wherever it is generated or in excess to wherever it is deficient and establishing a general average. Archimedes was almost the only philosopher among the ancients, so far as is known, who formed clear and correct notions concerning the simple machines. He acquired firm possession of the idea of pressure, which lies at the root of mechanical science and of equilibrium. The proof of the properties of the lever given in Archimedes' equiponderance of planes holds its place in textbooks to this day. His estimate of the efficiency of the lever is expressed in the saying attributed to him, Give me a fulcrum on which to stand, and I will move the earth. The equiponderance treats of solids, while the book on floating bodies treats of hydrostatics, or the equilibrium of fluids. It was long a common practice for mechanicians to recognize six simple machines or six devices representing the first principles of mechanics. These are the pulley, the lever, the wedge, the screw, the inclined plane, and the wheel and axle. In the latter part of the 18th century, however, Lagrange simplified the mechanical principles, including them all under two, the principle of the lever and the principle of the inclined plane. Every machine that exists, from the egg beater to the escalator, is constructed by the application of these principles, or a combination of them. The lever consists of a bar or rigid piece of any shape, acted upon at different points by two forces, which severally tend to rotate in opposite directions about a fixed axis. It was beautifully demonstrated by Archimedes that the power of one end and the weight or resistance at the other, are in equilibrium under certain conditions, the simplest being the case in which the load is ten times as great as the power, but the power is ten times as far from the fulcrum as the load is from the fulcrum, or stated otherwise, the two forces are in equilibrium when they are inversely as the length of their respective arms. There are three different kinds of levers, according to the relative positions of the three points. The fulcrum, the point of application of power, and the point of application of the load. 
The handle of a common pump is a lever of the first class, in which the fulcrum is between the other two points. The piston and the water are the weight, the hand of the worker is the power, while the pivot on which the handle turns is the fulcrum. The ordinary steel yard is another example of a lever of this class. The second class is formed by levers in which the weight is between the fulcrum and the power, as is illustrated by the wheelbarrow. The axle of the wheel is the fulcrum in this case, the load in the barrow is the weight, and the handles of the barrow are the levers. The boat with its oars is another example of this class of levers. In the third class of levers, the point of application of the power lies between the fulcrum and the load, and is illustrated by the lifting of a ladder when one end is resting on the ground. These distinctions are of slight importance, however, since they become confused as the machines to which they are applied become more complicated. The Archimedean laws, however, which apply the levers, are extremely simple, and illustrate the beauty with which physical or mechanical phenomena of apparently diverse types may often be reduced to law. First, the two extreme forces must always act in the same direction. Secondly, the middle one must act in the opposite direction and be equal to the sum of the other two. And thirdly, the magnitude of the extreme forces is inversely proportional to their distance from the middle one. Probably, of all devices of man, none is more frequently in evidence than the rope tackle used in hoisting, and known as the pulley. This is a contrivance for balancing a great force against a small one, or for lifting a big load with a small power. Its sole use is to produce equilibrium. It does not save work, unless indirectly in some unmechanical way. The pulley is a lever with equal arms, but when it turns, the attachment of the forces are moved. The wheel and axle, also one of the simple machines, works indirectly on the principle of the lever. In its primary form, it consists of a cylindrical axle on which a wheel, concentric with the axle, is firmly fastened. A rope is usually attached to the wheel, and the axle is turned by means of a lever. The rope acts as in the pulley, that is, upon the principle of the lever, which explains all the possible phenomena exhibited by the pulley and the wheel and axle, just as the principle of the inclined plane explains all the phenomena of the wedge and the screw. The inclined plane in mechanics is a plane inclined to the horizon, or forming with a horizontal plane any angle whatever except a right angle. It is one of the two fundamental machines, the other being the lever. The power necessary to sustain any weight on an inclined plane is to the weight as the height of the plane to its length. Figure 16, tower moved by windlass and pulleys, from a 16th century print. This was first proved by Stephen in the 16th century. If the inclined plane, with its horizontal plane, is a base, and the line connecting the two planes be considered as a right-angled triangle, the weights proportional to the hypotenuse and the height of the triangle balance. The screw and the wedge, both called simple machines, are special applications of this principle. The wedge consists of a very acute angled triangular prism of some hard material, which is driven in between objects to be separated, or into anything to be split. It is, of course, one of the commonest of implements, as is also the screw, but in the apparently simple action of these two devices lie the germs of some of the most effective instruments for increasing man's natural power. It is necessary to understand the exact function of each part of this apparently innocuous machine, the screw, in order to follow its development in the more complicated inventions. The screw is a cylinder of wood or metal having a spiral ridge, the thread, running round it, usually turning in a hollow cylinder in which a spiral channel is cut corresponding to the ridge. 
The convex and concave spirals with their supports are often called the screw and nut, and also the external or male screw and the internal or female screw respectively. The screw is virtually a spiral inclined plane, only the inclined plane is commonly used to overcome gravity, while the screw is more often used to overcome some other resistance. Screws are right and left according to the direction of the spiral. Screws have a variety of uses, the most important of which are two. First, they are used for balancing forces, as the drag screw against gravity, the propeller screw against the resistance of water, and the screw press against elasticity. Secondly, they are used for magnifying a motion and rendering it easily manageable and measurable, as in the screw feet of instruments, micrometer screws, and the like. Hunter's screw is a double screw consisting of a principal male screw that turns in a nut, but the cylinder of which, concentric with its axis, is formed by a female screw of different pitch that turns on a secondary but fixed male screw. The device furnishes an instrument of slow but enormous lifting power without the necessity of finely cut and consequently frail threads. Everything else being equal, the lifting power of this screw increases exactly as the difference between the pitches of the principal male screw and the female screw diminishes, in accordance with the principle of virtual velocities. Archimedes himself made several experimental applications of his screw, among which were a railway and a machine for lifting water. In the railway, a continuous shaft rotates on pillars between two lines of rails, and propels the car by means of a screw which engages in a pedestal attached to the car. The instrument for lifting water, technically called the Archimedean screw, is made by forming a spiral tube within or by winding a flexible tube spirally without a cylinder. Figure 17 the Archimedean screw. When the cylinder is placed in an inclined position and the lower end is immersed in water, its revolution will cause the water to move upward through the spiral chambers. The mechanical powers, as the six simple machines have long been called, are often in evidence in modern inventions almost in their original simplicity. The screw propeller, for instance, consists of a continuous spiral vane on a hollow core running lengthwise of a vessel. This is but an extension and amplification of the screw and was also devised by Archimedes. The modern screw propeller is attached to the exterior end of a shaft protruding through the hull of a vessel at the stern. It consists of a number of spiral metal blades either cast together in one piece or bolted to a hub. In some special cases, as in ferry boats, there are two screws, one at each end of the vessel. In some war vessels, transverse shafts with small propellers have been used to assist in turning quickly. An arrangement of screws now common is the twin screw system, in which two screws are arranged at the stern, each on one of two parallel shafts, which are driven by power independently one of the other. By stopping or slowing up one shaft while the other maintains its velocity, very rapid turning can be effected by twin screws, which have, moreover, the advantage that, one being disabled, the vessel can still make headway with the other. Some vessels designed to attain high speed have been constructed with three screws. A very great variety of forms have been proposed for screw propeller blades, but the principle of the original true screw is still in use. Variations in pitch and modifications of the form of the blades have been adopted with success by individual constructors. The actual area of the screw propeller is measured on a plane perpendicular to the direction in which the ship moves. The outline of the screw projected on that plane is the actual area, but the effective area is, in good examples, from 0.2 to 0.4 greater than this and it is the effective area and the mean velocity with which the water is thrown astern that determine the mass thrown backward. The mass thrown backward 
and the velocity with which it is so projected determine the propelling power. A kind of feathering propeller has also been used, but has not been generally approved. The mechanism of nature has offered suggestions for many inventions, one of which provides an illustration of many others. The ped rail, for instance, which is a rail moving on feet, is constructed on the principle of the horse. A horse has practically two wheels, its front legs one, its back legs the other. The shoulder and hip joints form the axes and the legs the spokes. So the ped rail has wheels the spokes of which, to any number, are connected at their outer ends by flat plates. As each angle of the plates is passed, the wheel falls plumb onto the next plate. The greater the number of spokes, the less will be each successive jar or step and consequently the perfect wheel is theoretically one in which the sides have been so much multiplied as to be infinitely short. With the exception of Archimedes and a few mathematicians of the Alexandrian school, the ancients and the generations of the Middle Ages slept, so far as mechanical science was concerned, in an untroubled peace. Not until the 17th century were some of the Aristotelian myths of science banished, when Galileo aroused the mechanical and scientific genius of the age. Among the curious vagarities of imagination which have deluded the human mind, none is more interesting than the idea of perpetual motion, which has been followed for centuries with fatuous hope. Perpetual motion, in a mechanical sense, is a motion that is preserved and continuously renewed of itself without the aid of any external cause. It is, however, one of the chimeras of the brain which has its aspects of plausibility for the tyro. Many historic machines purporting to display the power of perpetual motion have brought their inventors to poverty, if not to despair. One authoritative writer says, in order to produce a perpetual motion, we have only to remove all the obstacles which oppose that motion, and it is obvious that if we could do this, any motion whatever would be a perpetual motion. But how are we to get rid of these obstacles? Can the friction between two touching bodies be entirely annihilated? Or has any substance yet been found that is void of friction? Can we totally remove all the resistance of the air, which is a force continually varying? And does the air at all times retain its impeding force? These things cannot be removed so long as the present laws of nature continue to exist. Every attempt to produce a self-moving machine has been in open defiance to the coordinated relations of force and motion, and any man who comprehends this law of velocity will no sooner attempt to solve the problem of perpetual motion than to climb upon his own shoulders as a higher point of observation. But in the search for an impossibility, so many valuable and practical certainties have been demonstrated that perhaps no time has been absolutely thrown away. As alchemy fostered and developed chemistry, so the search after perpetual motion has taught scientists how to apply force through complicated machinery and has given rise to many new devices. Figure 18, Ferguson's machine to show the fallacy of perpetual motion schemes. The axle is placed horizontally and the spokes turn in a vertical position. The spokes are jointed as shown and to each of them is fixed a frame in which a weight D moves. When any spoke is in a horizontal position, the weight D in it falls down and pulls the weighted arm A of the then vertical spoke straight out by means of a cord C going over the pulley B to the weight D. But when the spokes come about to the left hand, their weights fall back and cease pulling, so that the spokes then bend at their joints and the balls at their ends come nearer the center of the left side as the balls or weights at the right hand side are farther from the center than they are on the left. It might be supposed that this machine would turn round perpetually, but it is a mere balance. In treating of perpetual motion, that grand secret for the discovery of which those dictators of philosophy, Democritus, Pythagoras, Plato, did travel unto the gymnosophists and Indian priests, 
its history would be a fascinating but tragic tale. Each contrivance hitherto planned or experimented upon has been proved fallible. Paracelsus built a little world, Cornelius Drebbel invented a planetarium for King James, and Peregrinus suggested the magnetical globe of Torella, which he thought might be kept in motion by pieces of steel and lodestones, and Bishop Wilkins himself made an application of Archimedes' screw, but all were alike found inadequate to the grand end for which they were designed. End of section 23 End of chapter 4. Mechanical Principles Section 24 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in March 2021. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Part 3 Mathematical Applications. Chapter 5 Machines. In a general mechanical sense, a machine is any instrument which converts motion, or rather force, into motion, as, for instance, a machine designed to convert rapid motion into slow motion, as a windlass, or, vice versa, as the connection of a large wheel to a small increases the velocity of the latter. The ordinary tools consisting of a single device, such as the hammer, or a simple combination of moving parts, such as shears or tongs, are machines, in the strict technical definition of the term. Many writers have used the word in a sense other than the strictly technical one, as Huxley, when he says, The human body, like all living bodies, is a machine, all the operations of which will, sooner or later, be explained on physical principles. Among the most ancient machines were those that employed wind or flowing water as a motor power for turning wheels. In medieval times, even bellows were adapted to this purpose. The windmill is a familiar device for raising water from a well or spring, for grinding and other purposes. There are two types of these wind motors, the vertical being the most common. The vertical motor consists essentially of a horizontal wind shaft with a combination of sails or vanes fixed at the end of the shaft and suitable gearing for conveying the motion of the wind shaft to the pump or to the other machinery. The typical Dutch windmill was provided with four vanes or sail frames called whips covered with canvas and provided with arrangements for reefing the sails in a high wind. To present the vanes to the wind, the whole structure or tower was at first turned round by means of a long lever. Later, the top of the tower, or cap, was made movable. Windmills are now made with many wooden vanes forming a disc exposed to the winds and fitted with automatic feathering and steering machinery, governors for regulating the speed and apparatus for closing the vanes in storms. These improved windmills are chiefly an American invention and are used for pumping water. Water power is perhaps, after wind power, the most natural and the most truly economic source of energy. The term water power is not exact, since the real agent in water machines is gravity, the fluid itself being only the medium through which the action of gravity is transmitted to the prime motor. In order that water may be available for doing work, it must be in such a position that it can fall from a higher to a lower level, or must be under pressure produced by some external force, such as that of a weight or spring acting on the surface of the fluid through a piston or plunger. Under the former condition, its utmost capacity for doing work is the product of the height through which it can fall into the weight of the water falling. For practical purposes, there are three ways by which water power can be applied to the performance of work. 
through the velocity of the fluid itself, by weight, or by pressure. Each of these three methods requires a different type of motor for its application. An illustration of the first is the turbine, which is moved by the force of projected water. The second, the water wheel, which is moved by the weight of the falling water. The third, the hydraulic pressure engine, which operates by the application of the hydraulic law of equal pressure. The old-fashioned mill for grinding flour or corn, which was once the center of nearly every New England village, was run by water flowing over the upper wings of a clumsy wooden wheel. These overshot wheels are now nearly obsolete, but have been constructed in the past on rather gigantic plans. The water falls from a sluice or pen trough near the top and moves the wheel by falling into floats or shallow buckets. It is regulated by a gate and falls into the third or fourth bucket from the summit, thus utilizing as much as possible of the gravitational force. The undershot wheel turns by having the force of the stream of water act at its lowest point instead of its summit. But the numerous disadvantages of the water wheels described have caused them to be almost entirely superseded by the turbine. This is a water wheel driven by the impact or reaction of a stream of water flowing against a series of radical buckets, or by impact and reaction combined. Turbines are usually horizontally rotating wheels on vertical shafts. They are of various constructions and may be classed as reaction turbines, whose buckets move in a direction opposite to that of the flow, impulse turbines, whose buckets move with the flow, and the combined reaction and impulse wheels, which include the best modern types of turbines. In these, a very high percentage of the potential energy of water is converted into work while passing through the wheels. Impulse wheels, constructed as large as 18 and a half feet in diameter, have been employed to work air compressors in mines. A wheel of this size weighs 10,000 pounds and runs at 110 revolutions per minute. It has energy equal to 300 horsepower. The wheel is made of iron plates riveted together, which are held concentric with the shaft by radial spokes. There is a variable nozzle operated by an automatic hydraulic regulator through which the water is applied to the wheel. It will run at uniform speed with varying loads. Turbines are now made from 6 to 80 feet in diameter and are so cheap, durable and highly effective that they are fast superseding other types of wheels. Two other important applications of water power are found in the hydraulic press and the hydraulic ram. The hydraulic press is operated by the pressure of a liquid under the action either of gravity or of some mechanical device such as a force pump. It depends on the law of hydrostatics that any pressure upon a body of water is distributed equally in all directions throughout the whole mass, whatever its shape. In the more common forms of hydraulic press, the pressure of a piston upon a body of water in a cylinder of small area is distributed through pipes or openings to a piston or a larger area. The statical force is thus multiplied in the direct ratio of the areas of the pistons. Therefore, if the diameter of a small piston is one inch and of a larger piston in the cylinder is one foot, the area of the larger piston will be 144 times the area of the smaller, and if a load of one ton is applied to the smaller, the larger will exert an upward statical force of 144 tons. This interesting machine is used as the basis of a great number of inventions, such as the hydraulic block, jack, crane, hoist, lift, and others, and for the pressing of paper and other materials. The hydraulic ram is a self-contained and automatic pump, operated partly by the pressure of a column of water in a pipe and partly by the living force acquired by the intermittent motion of the column. This machine can be used to raise water to a height many times greater than the available head, 
and it is also adapted to draw water from a source independent of that which supplies the power for operating it. Hydraulic machines are very wonderful to people who observe their action for the first time. With a common hydraulic press, a laborer, without any other help, can raise a load of a hundred tons, which is the weight of a long railway train. At large ship docks, any boy can, by the manipulation of a few handles, lift heavy weights rapidly from a ship and place them on the dock. No single invention in the history of the world has had so deep and wide an influence as the steam engine. This truism is one which deserves consideration, even in days when there is all too much exploitation of the mechanical inventiveness of the age. If the possibility of travel which the locomotive has brought within the reach of nearly every one be considered, apart from any other uses of the steam engine, its extraordinary influence on the life of the century is startlingly apparent. Until within fifty years, travel and acquaintance with foreign peoples, historic monuments and all the artistic accumulations of other nations and other generations were the privilege of very few. In these days, traveling is the universal epidemic. More than that, with better acquaintance, nation has reacted upon nation, so that political and military problems have taken on a wholly different aspect. The germ of the steam engine existed in Heron's Aeoli pile, invented in the 2nd century BC. This illustrated perfectly the expansive force of steam generated in a closed vessel and escaping by a narrow aperture. It consisted of a hollow ball containing water and two arms bent in opposite directions, from the narrow apertures of which steam issued with such a force that the air, reacting on it, caused a circular or rotary motion of the ball. Several attempts have been made to apply the principle of the Aeoli pile to rotating machinery. In 1705 there was invented the first important device for the practical application of steam power. For about 1,500 years after Heron's Aeoli pile, no progress had been made. During the 17th century, steam fountains were designed, but they were merely modifications of Heron's engine and were probably applied only for ornamental purposes. Some effort was also made by Moreland, Papin and Savory to construct practical machines for the raising of water or driving of millworks. The first successful attempt to combine the principles and forms of mechanism then known into an economical and convenient machine was made by Thomas Newcomen, a blacksmith of Dartmouth, England. It is probable that he knew of Savory's engine, as Savory lived only fifteen miles away. Assisted by John Calley, Newcomen constructed an engine, an atmospheric steam engine, for which a patent was secured in 1705. In 1711 such a machine was set up at Wolverhampton for the raising of water. Steam passing from the boiler into the cylinder held the piston up against the external atmospheric pressure until the passage between the cylinder and boiler was closed by a cock. Then the steam in the cylinder was condensed by a jet of water. A partial vacuum was formed and the air above pressed the piston down. This piston was suspended from one end of an overhead beam, the other end of the beam carrying the pump rod. Desaguliers tells the story that a boy, Humphrey Potter, who was charged with the duty of opening and closing the stopcock between the boiler and cylinder for every stroke, contrived by catches and strings an automatic motion of the cock. The flywheel was introduced in 1736 by Jonathan Hulls. The next great improvements were introduced in Scotland by James Watt in the latter half of the 18th century. Watt was educated as a maker of mathematical instruments, and in 1760 he opened a shop in Glasgow. Becoming interested in the steam engine and its history, he began to experiment in a scientific manner. He took up chemistry and was assisted in his studies by Dr. Black, the discovery of latent heat. 
observing the great loss of heat in the newcomen engine due to the cooling of the cylinder by the jet of water at every stroke he began to think of means to keep the cylinder always as hot as the steam that entered it he has told us how finally the happy thought securing this end occurred to him i had gone to take a walk on a fine sabbath afternoon i had entered the green by the gate at the foot of charlotte street and had passed the old washing house i was thinking upon the engine at the time and had gone as far as the herd's house when the idea came into my mind that as steam was an elastic body it would rush into a vacuum and if a communication were made between the cylinder and an exhausted vessel it would rush into it and might be there condensed without cooling the cylinder through this invention the piston was now moved by the expansion of steam not by air pressure as in newcomen's engine watt introduced a separate condenser a steam jacket and other improvements he deservedly commands a preeminent place among those who took part in the development of the steam engine the expiration of watt's vital patent occurred in eighteen hundred and he himself then retired from the active supervision of his engineering business having virtually finished his life's work on the last year of the century one of the first and most obvious uses of the steam engine was to apply its power to locomotion both on sea and land before steam lent its power to the propulsion of ships navigation was like the windmill subject to the intermittent character of the winds or limited to the manpower of rowers the method of moving vessels by paddle wheels was adopted by the romans probably borrowed from the egyptians but the wheels were turned by handles within the vessels operated by men there are several obscure references in annals of the seventeenth century to what is supposed to be the propulsion of paddle wheels by steam among the rest there is a description of a steam propeller invented by one genevois a pastor at bern which was formed like the foot of a duck this was made to expand and present a large surface to the water when moved against it and to close up into a small compass when moved in the opposite direction in seventeen seventy four there is a tradition of a boat which when tried upon the seine near paris moved against the stream though slowly the engine being of insufficient power the construction of this engine is attributed to the count d'ociron a french nobleman many attempts to apply the force of the steam engine to the propulsion of paddle wheels was made in the latter part of the eighteenth century and it is said that william symington an english inventor accomplished a certain form of steam navigation but it was left for robert fulton an american artist as well as inventor to bring the trials to a successful issue in eighteen o nine fulton's steam vessel the clermont made her first voyage from new york to albany a distance of about one hundred forty miles at the rate of five miles an hour to those who viewed this spectacle this first steamer had a most terrific appearance she used dry pine wood for fuel and sent forth a column of ignited vapor for a distance of many feet above the flue and whenever the fire was stirred showers of sparks flew off into the air one of the chroniclers states notwithstanding the wind and tide were adverse to its approach they saw with astonishment that the vessel was rapidly coming toward them and when it came so near that the noise of the machinery and paddles was heard the crews in some instances shrank beneath their decks from the terrific sight and left their vessels to go ashore while others prostrated themselves and besought providence to protect them from the approach of the horrible monster which was marching on the tide and lighting its path by the fire which it vomited the clermont was of one hundred sixty tons burden the paddle wheels were fifteen feet in diameter and dipped two feet in the water she was impelled by a machine of four foot stroke and a two foot cylinder within a few weeks after the appearance of the clermont stevens of hoboken launched a steam vessel 
she could not ply on the waters of the Hudson, in consequence of the exclusive patent of Fulton and Livingston, so she was taken to the Delaware. This was the first steamer that ever sailed the ocean. From that time, steamboats have multiplied till every water in the civilized portion of the earth was marked with these agents of rapid intercourse. For the purpose of comparison, the Cunard steamer Lusitania, launched in 1907, may be placed beside that of the Clermont. The Lusitania is 790 feet long and 88 feet broad. She has a displacement of 45,000 tons and is propelled by four screws rotated by turbine engines of 68,000 horsepower. Placed in perspective, her length would outreach the angular height of the Great Pyramid. The history of locomotion on land presents a parallel tale of simple beginnings and extraordinarily rapid progress. The Stourbridge Lion was the first locomotive brought to America and was tried on the road at Honesdale, Pennsylvania, on the 8th of August, 1829. Its boiler was 16 and a half feet long. The two cylinders were three foot stroke and its weight was seven tons. It was operated around a curve and up the road for about two miles and then was returned to the place of starting. The experiment demonstrated that the track was not substantial enough for so heavy an engine and it was housed beside the track where it remained for 15 years. It was then removed to Carbondale where the boiler was used for stationary purposes and the remainder was sold for old iron. This ignominious end to the first attempt to utilize the steam engine for locomotion on land in America did not discourage other people from making other trials. Peter Cooper, having an interest in the Baltimore and Ohio Road, in 1829 built an engine known as the Tom Thumb to demonstrate that a locomotive could be built that would run around short curves. This engine had an upright boiler 20 inches in diameter by 5 feet high, fitted with gun barrels for flues. The engine drove a large gear, which fitted into a smaller gear on the axle. The fire was urged by a fan driven by a belt. The driving wheels were two and a half feet in diameter. In August 1830, the first railroad car in America propelled by a locomotive was tested on the Baltimore and Ohio Road. The wheels were coned, which was the first use of this principle as applied to car wheels. Cooper's engine was coupled to a car in front of it, containing a load of four and a half tons, including 24 passengers. The trip of 13 miles was made in one hour and 15 minutes, and the return trip in 57 minutes. This was the first locomotive built in America. In the locomotive engines used at the present time, it is not unusual to see engines for passenger service, which have a total weight of about 185,000 pounds, cylinders 22 inches in diameter and a piston stroke of 30 inches. The locomotive will now at least double the speed of the racehorse, and will carry not only itself, but three or four times its own weight in addition, and will go a hundred miles without stopping, if only the road ahead be clear. The fastest mechanism of any size which has ever cut its way through the water for any considerable distance is the torpedo boat Ariette, made by a London firm in 1887. This little craft has a displacement of 110 tons and machinery capable of exerting 1,290 effective horsepower. The speed accomplished at the trial tests was 30 miles per hour, this being the average of six one-mile tests. End of section 24. Section 25 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in March 2021. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 8. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. 
Part 3. Mathematical Applications. Chapter 6. Aviation. For more than two centuries, man has been trying to invent a means whereby he might navigate the air, but it is only since the beginning of the twentieth century that any degree of success has been attained. The apparatus used in aviation divides, roughly, into two classes, dirigible balloons and the so-called gasless or heavier-than-air machines, represented by the biplane, the ornithopter or beating-wing machine, and the helicopter or direct-lift machine. The dirigible balloon has already, relatively speaking, arrived at some degree of perfection, insomuch as the serious difficulties connected with this type of aerial locomotive have been largely overcome. The gas bag, with the volume of gas employed, has been brought to its smallest practicable size, and the weight of subsidiary material and machinery has, it is believed, been brought to its lowest limit of safety. With the inventions of Count Zeppelin, Germany has been in the lead, so far as actual progress in the making of dirigible balloons is concerned, but France is a close second. As long ago as 1907, the Zeppelin dirigible, 413 feet in length, attained a speed of 34 miles an hour and covered more than 200 miles in one ascent, which lasted eight hours. La Patrie, a dirigible owned by the French government, travelled without rest from Paris to Verdun, 142.8 miles, at a mean speed of more than 20 miles an hour. Great Britain, Italy, Spain and the United States have also produced dirigibles, but no essential advance in the principle has been made. The American Baldwin dirigible has a gas bag of 84 feet in length, with a capacity of 18,000 cubic feet. The frame is 66 feet long. The 12-foot propeller, placed on the forward end of the frame, has a speed of 450 revolutions a minute. The ship is kept on an even keel and is lowered or raised by a number of box-like planes near the forward end, operated by the aviator. It is driven by a 20-horsepower Curtis engine. The frame is almost as long as the gas bag and is attached to it by means of a fine strong netting, while the operators are carried in two cars. The Baldwin is distinctly an American machine, but bears a general resemblance to the enormous German dirigibles. Germany, represented by Count Zeppelin, has made significant contributions to aeronautics. August 1909 was commemorated by a recording-breaking flight of the dirigible Zeppelin III from Friedrichshafen to Berlin. It was a triumph of Count Zeppelin's scientific skill and his patient courage and perseverance. At the end of the remarkable journey, the roofs, streets and parks of the German capital swarmed with people, singing and cheering, as the airship sailed round the palace and cathedral and landed in the Tempelhof parade ground, where the emperor, empress and many leading officials were waiting to receive the aged count. The dirigible, as at present designed, consists of a huge skeleton framework of aluminium alloy over which is stretched continental rubberized fabric. The ship is sixteen-sided, with long, lattice-work girders springing out from the solid central prow, giving the ship the required shape. It is something more than 440 feet long and has 17 separate gas envelopes. It can be used over water, owing to its floating cars, it can mount duplicate engines of considerable horsepower, and it has a far wider range of action and utility than any other aerial vessel. Already it holds every record in distance, altitude and duration in the air. The helicopter is a machine with an upright shaft and revolving blades, which can rise nearly vertically or at a steep angle and has other points of advantage over the aeroplane, though it has not yet been perfected for practical use. It is said that the helicopter was first suggested 400 years ago by the artist Leonardo da Vinci, 
as a practical, comparatively simple and inexpensive flying device. One of the most successful helicopters has two superposed propellers in horizontal parallel planes mounted on concentric hollow shafts, revolving in opposite directions and driven by an eight-cylinder, 40-horsepower, air-cooled Curtis motor. The propellers are 17 feet in diameter and the platform is 16 feet square. The machine possesses in a marked degree the desiderata of initial stability and flexibility of movement. It has attained a speed of 30 miles an hour. The aeroplane, it is evident, has not nearly attained its possible limit of perfection. The great originator of the flying machine was Lilienthal, who, after exhaustive study and experimentation with specially designed apparatus, modelled after the wings of birds, was the first man to glide with large wing-like surfaces through the air. Lilienthal was compelled to use his machine merely as an aerial coaster, as there was no light motor then in existence. Several distinguished aerial engineers have emulated Lilienthal's zeal, among whom are Herring, the Wright brothers, and Glenn H. Curtis in America, Henri Blériot in France, Henry Farman and Latham in England. Herring improved on Lilienthal's machine, changing his design and providing the glider with a wonderful mechanism which performed most of Lilienthal's acrobatic feats automatically. To one of these machines he later applied stored power in the shape of compressed air. Applying this to two large wooden screw propellers, he was able to fly horizontally, instead of coasting downward for the short time his power would last. Since then, Curtis has invented a light motor of great ingenuity, which has successfully been applied to the aeroplane and the helicopter. The actual methods by which practical progress is made in the equipment and operation of these machines is more or less shrouded in mystery, so far as the public is concerned, but results are evident. The Wright brothers began work on the Lilienthal basis, as did Herring. They also worked out their own methods of controlling the glider by mechanical means. The chief feature of the Wright aeroplane lies in the application of the petrol motor to the propelling blades. It is the lightness of this motor that has made progress possible in this direction. The propellers force the machine through the air, and the two planes, from which the machine gets its name, biplane, support it. The two planes are rigid at their tips, which can be twisted in order to prevent too much tilting when turning. It is guided by a horizontal rudder in front and another, ordinary rudder, at the rear. The length of the planes had become difficult to handle, therefore it was cut in two and one plane placed above the other. The whole mechanism is handled by a single operator who is seated in the center of the lower plane. The Aerial Experiment Association operating at Hammondsport, New York, has contributed interesting chapters to the history of aviation. The June Bug, a very efficient type of aeroplane, was constructed by this body. In winning the trophy on July 4, 1908, the machine rose rapidly to a height of 20 feet and sped on, traversing a distance of one mile in one minute and 42 seconds, corresponding to an average speed of 35 one-tenth miles per hour. The first transoceanic flight was that of Blériot, the French experimenter, who performed in August 1909 the feat of crossing the English Channel in a monoplane. During the first week of August 1909, the first international aviation race meet held anywhere in the world took place near the city of Reims, France. It was there that the best achievements of the heavier-than-air machines were exhibited, and practically every contribution to the science of aviation by motor placed before the public. The exhibitions of aerial skill were such as to make the week a memorable one in the history of aviation. New records were made and broken every day, and the safety of the flying machines was as remarkable as their efficiency. Flights were made during rain, and when the wind was blowing 25 miles an hour. 
Altogether, there were 38 aeroplanes entered in the various contests and races, for which $40,000 in cash prizes was offered. The machines which made flights were divided about equally between the monoplane and the biplane types, although the latter type was rather more in favor. Of the machines of this kind, five were right biplanes. Five were biplanes of the Voisin cellular type with a tail, and three of the Farman type with a tail, but without vertical partitions between the main planes. The Curtis biplane, which is modeled closely after the pattern used by the Wright brothers, represented America. These machines were entered in contests for speed in long-distance flights, for sprints, for passenger-carrying power, and for duration of flight. Flights of half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half became common early in the meeting, and on Tuesday, M. Paul Han, driving a voisin biplane, broke the record made by Wilbur Wright at Le Mans, France, in 1908, by flying for two hours and 43 minutes. In that time, he covered 83 miles and only descended when his fuel was exhausted. The next day, his record, in point of distance, was promptly superseded by M. Latham, the French aerialist, who made the first, though unsuccessful, attempt to fly across the English Channel. In an Antoinette monoplane, M. Latham circled the course 15 times, covering a distance of 96 miles in 2 hours and 18 minutes. This is about the same time that Mr. Wright remained in the air on his record flight in 1908, but during that time he covered only 77 miles. On the 28th, Friday, Mr. Farman, an Englishman, flying in a biplane of his own design, once more set the mark at a higher point. He flew about 118 miles, remaining in the air more than three hours, breaking the records made both by M. Latham and M. Paulhan. His performance won for him the Champagne Grand Prize. Blériot made the best time for a single round of the course during the first part of the week, covering the distance of six one-fifth miles in almost exactly eight minutes and four seconds. In the middle of the week, the International Aviation Trophy was contested. France was represented by two monoplanes, a Blériot and an Antoinette, and a Wright biplane, while America was represented by one tiny biplane with an eight-cylinder motor, designed and operated by Glenn H. Curtis. The real race was between Blériot and Curtis, the champions of the biplane and monoplane types of flying machines, respectively. The morning of the contest, August 28, was mild, calm, and hazy at Reims. Curtis, after a preliminary round of the course, circled round once in front of the grandstand and crossed the line at full speed. The aeroplane pitched perceptibly, and the turns were at first rather wide. Nevertheless, he made the two rounds in record time, the second being four one-fifth seconds faster than the first. The total time of the rounds was 15 minutes, 53 fifths seconds, corresponding to an average speed of 47.04 miles an hour. Blériot was unable to better this record, though his monoplane flew splendidly, without any rolling or pitching. His time was five three-fifths seconds more than that of Curtis. The third place in the competition was secured by Latham, who flew at a height of about 150 feet and covered the course in 17 minutes 32 seconds. Lefebvre, the third French representative, with a right biplane fitted with a 40-horsepower motor, was fourth, making the course in 20 minutes 47 seconds. The passenger-carrying competition was won by Henry Farman, who, after making a round with one passenger in 9 minutes 53 4 fifths seconds, carried two people around the course at a speed of 34.96 miles an hour. The total life weight lifted by his machine was in the neighborhood of 450 pounds. Farman's biplane was the only machine that succeeded in carrying three people. Blériot's number 12 monoplane, however, 
was the first aeroplane to accomplish this feat, which it did at Douai in June 1909. At that time, a total weight of 1,234 pounds was carried at about 30 miles an hour with a 30-horsepower motor. The chief event of the meet at Reims, however, was the contest for the James Gordon Bennett Cup of the fastest flight of 30 kilometers. Early in the week, it was evident that Blériot and Curtis were the two serious candidates for this prize, and the excitement over the two contestants was intense. Blériot started on his journey, crossed the line, and made the first turn at a rapid rate, flying at a low elevation. He disappeared from sight, however, at the far end of the long course, and presently it was found that his machine had suddenly dived to the ground, caught fire, and was rapidly being consumed. This unfortunate accident eliminated serious rivalry to the American machine, which had already proved its remarkable powers. Curtis made the three rounds of the course in his 60-horsepower biplane in 23 minutes 29 seconds, or at a speed corresponding to 47.6 miles an hour. The second lap of the course was made at a speed of 47.73 miles an hour. Latham, with the Antoinette monoplane, was second in this contest, and the Wright biplane third. Thus, the Prix de la Vitesse also fell to Curtis, bringing to America the lion's share of the honors of the meeting. The Curtis biplane carries an eight-cylinder water-cooled motor, weighing 200 pounds. All valves are mechanically operated and the ignition is by magnet. The weight of the aeroplane loaded is 700 pounds. The total surface is 225 square feet. The thrust developed by the propellers is 280 pounds, and its greatest speed is 47.73 miles an hour. The machine is, in comparison to the other types of biplane, compact and small, weighing less than half as much as those of his competitors. The contest seems to have settled many of the mood questions concerning stability, landing and manipulation of the machines. The most important factor appears to be the reliability of the motor. The spectacle during the week's contest was an unprecedented one, for at times six machines were in the air at once. The last few years have seen the revolutionary triumph of the flying machine over gravity. The coming years will see its evolutionary subjugation of the treacherous element into which it has launched itself. Flight is a new mental and physical experience, says Thomas S. Baldwin, the inventor of the U.S. military dirigible balloon, in a recent article. It transposes one to a world of action and emotion, in direct contrast to much of what one feels and lives on the hard surface of the globe. It tends to exhilarate and exalt the mind. It changes the registry and the workings of a number of the human sensors, and it breathes into the body an overflowing measure of health, endurance, and power. The elimination of the force of gravity affects the habits of gravity. The mind's freedom is denoted by an enormous increase of energy and power of action. The gravity of every square inch of the plane on which one stands or sits, and of every ounce of one's body, have been neutralized by a buoyancy of a gas lighter than air or by mechanical force and pressure upon the air. The aeronaut brings a measure of this power from the heavens down to the earth with him as he alights from his ship. After a long voyage, one touches the ground with the feeling that he can step over tall buildings, leap broad rivers, and fly from place to place. His tread upon the ground is like walking upon bags of wool. This fact explains why so small a percentage of persons who fall in flight are killed. This apparent lightness and buoyancy remains in the very bones for many hours after one has made a protracted aerial voyage, and lures one back to the height of the air. It is a sensation of pleasure that the great majority of humanity have yet to know. First we shall fly a step in a crude machine, we have begun to do that, then in time we shall sail the air in great ships, 
and in some remote day man will pass through the air in his own body solely. No one who has keenly felt the joy and triumph of flight in his own person can fail to believe in this last prediction. But it would be doing mathematics a grievous injustice to level its applicative value to mechanical inventiveness, for if there is one thing that is more sure than another, it is that the development of machinery, marvellous though it has been, is but one, and a small, part of the heritage that modern mathematics has given. The scope of logistics is immeasurable, and there are not wanting evidences that abstruse subjects supposed to be inherently psychologic may come under the magic spell of number. Whether imagination itself shall ever be reduced to a fourth dimension in space, man cannot yet know. But regarding that spiritual essence of man, the mathematician has always his fixed idea. Cassius J. Kaiser couples the science with what was once known as the queen of all sciences, and makes mathematics the key to a vaster realm than it has hitherto conquered. I do not believe, he says, that the present declined state of theology is destined to be permanent. The present is but an interregnum in her reign, and her fallen days will have an end. She has been deposed mainly because she has not seen fit to avail herself promptly and fully of the dispensations of advancing knowledge. The aims, however, of the ancient mistress are as high as ever, and when she shall have made good her present lack of modern education and learned to extend a generous and eager hospitality to modern light, she will reascend and will occupy with dignity as of yore an exalted place in the ascending scale of human interests and the esteem of enlightened men. And mathematics, by the character of her inmost being, is especially qualified, I believe, to assist in the restoration. It was but little more than a generation ago that the mathematician, philosopher and theologian Bernhard Bolzano dispelled the clouds that throughout all the foregone centuries had developed the notion of infinitude in darkness, completely sheared the great term of its vagueness without shearing it of its strength, and thus rendered it forever available for the purposes of logical discourse. Whereas, too, in former times, the infinite betrayed its presence not indeed to the faculties of logic, but only to the spiritual imagination and sensibility, mathematics has shown, even during the life of the elder men here present, and the achievement marks an epoch in the history of man, that the structure of transfinite being is open to exploration by the organon of thought. Again, it is in the mathematical doctrine of invariance, the realm wherein are sought and found configurations and types of being, that, amid the swirl and stress of countless hosts of transformations, remain immutable, and the spirit dwells in contemplation of the serene and eternal reign of the subtle law of form, it is there that theology may find, if she will, the clearest conceptions, the noblest symbols, the most inspiring intimations, the most illuminating illustrations, and the surest guarantees of the object of her teaching and her quest, an eternal being, unchanging in the midst of the universal flux. End of section 25 End of The Science History of the Universe Volume 8. Mathematics. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler.